You're listening to the Frugal Crafter Podcast. I'm Lindsay Weirick, and I am pleased to have Becca Hilburn back on the show. She is a comic artist and an art supply reviewer, and she just got back from the Nanta Creativation Art Materials Trade Show, and she is going to tell us what's new in the world of art supplies. Becca, welcome back. Thank you so much for having me again. Oh, I am so happy to have you back. Uh, can you explain what Nanta Creativation is to anyone that's unfamiliar? Yeah, so it's, we'll start with the acronym. It is the International Art Materials Trade Association's trade show. So NAMTA is a group of historically art supply buyers and manufacturers. So like Dick Blake Jerry's, David's Art Center, as well as like Fila Coal Arts, right? So it was very consumer facing. And they combined with CHA a few years ago, that's more craft centric. And that was also more public facing than NAMTA was to form Creativation, which is their big arts and craft material trade show. And I tried to join years ago when they were just NAMTA and I was just running an art supply review blog or blog at the time. And they didn't have an artist membership available. The, the cheapest membership was like $1,000. I was like, I can't, I can't swing that for a hobby. Um, but they have since started offering two types of reduced rate memberships. One of them is for not me. <laughs> the other is the creative professional digital content creator. So I applied, I filled out a bunch of questions, they accepted me, and $200 later, I am a member of NAMTA. Oh, that's wonderful. How did it seem this year? Was it busy or? So according to, so as we talked about last time I hung out with you, I come from like the world of doing like anime cons and comic cons. So like I am used to really packed shows like no breathing room, no moving room. So it wasn't that busy. And I thought, oh, maybe this is normal. This is business spacing. But according to all of the retailers I talked to who were there, it was kind of slow this year. And that's because we're losing a lot of our brick and mortar mom and pop art supply stores. A lot of them went out of business during the pandemic or they can't compete with Amazon. So it wasn't as busy as they would have liked. I remember in the days of Creativation, they used to, well, the CHA, they used to actually do two shows a year. They would do a um, a big show in California in January, and then they would do a show in like Chicago or some other location in the middle of the year. And then there was also like the New York stationery show. So there were technically like three shows that were like craft and paper craft centered heavily on the scrapbooking. And then they, um, I don't know if the, if the stationery show still goes on, but they dropped the second CHA show and then just had the winter one for a couple of years before they combined with, um, with NAMTA to, I guess, pull the audience a bit. And also for stores that sell both crafts and art supplies, make it so they don't have to make two trips, which I think is really considerate for, uh, for folks. Cause it's gotta be expensive to attend those as a, as a shopkeeper, I would imagine. It is like, like two thousand to ten thousand dollars as a store to buy a membership, but that includes your employees. Does that include your like their booth rental too? If they're so most brick and mortar stores don't have a booth there. Um, I think there was like one or two consumer groups, like the watercolor or the pen, color pencil artists of America had a set up. Uh, this is really more for the manufacturers, the distributors to sell their products in bulk to these stores. Oh, they're probably paying a lot more than two to $10,000 then. Oh yeah. Yeah. It must've been exciting to see everything all displayed and all of the products. Um, is there anything that you were really excited about this year? Yes. Uh, I'm going to answer the first question first, because it was, <laughs> it was so cool. Everybody had their store setups, like, like, like if, as though you were selling, right? And the friend who came with me, we both thought it, there would be some selling going on as well because of the setups. No, they sell the displays in addition to selling the merchandise. So this was to give stores a chance to see how this might look in their store, what display options they could buy. So it was like intensely exciting. And then it was like, oh, but we can't buy anything. <laughs> So it was very like, and it makes sense why this is stuff that isn't going to be released. A lot of it isn't going to be released until 
later 2024, 2025, or they're multiple years from now, because there were a lot of vendors from China, like factories from China looking to make contacts. So it was really exciting and it was really cool, but it was, if I was not an art supply reviewer, it probably would have been painful to see all these things that I absolutely can't have for like two or three years. And the coolest oh, I imagine. thing, there was a lot of really cool things. Uh, so I'm going to break that into two categories because I'm in a very nerdy mood today. Um, Some of the coolest displays were the ones, the companies that had just money to splash. So Cole Arts had this huge interactive display. Fila had a huge display with like multiple zones. And Golden had this interesting display that didn't photograph well um, because it was more interactive, but it was really cool to see in person. Um, in terms of products that I'm like really looking forward to, Mungyo has a magnetic palette that they're going to be doing with Jerry's Artorama that I'm really excited about. It's like makeup tins. Like if you're familiar oh, with nice. the makeup, yeah, the makeup artist yeah. will, they'll use like a magnetic palette and then have these magnetic half pans. And mm-hmm. I've thought about buying that from Amazon and doing it myself, but I, I, I don't know. Like, I don't know the effort, right? That's exciting. Uh, Shin Han is really coming to compete. Like they were super nice, but like they are offering watercolor half pans now. They oh, wow. are offering acrylic markers. They're still offering alcohol markers with refills. Mm-hmm. And um, they, so recently I reviewed their Korean color watercolors. They're coming out with art kits to teach you how to do Minwa style watercolor. Oh. So yeah, wow. and y- Yasutomo's got some like really exciting Japanese art kits that they're working on too. I like their stuff. It's always um, fairly priced and it's fun to try something new, you know, mm-hmm. with the Yasutomo products. I'm excited about the Shinhan because uh, a while back, this was probably a couple of years ago, I bought the, um, Amazon had a great price, the 32 set for about $85. And I knew there were some fugitive colors in there, but I'm like, for that price, that's a great deal. And I enjoyed it so much. I bought their past their tints set and, um, oh, nice. And I really enjoyed that too. I don't use it as often as I should, but now the prices have have gone way up. So I'm wondering if, um, if those are going up because now they're entering the American market a little bit more. And so, I mean, I could, uh, that could be the case. Maybe what do you do? Have uh, some Shinhan paints there? Uh, yeah, uh, these came from the show. So I went to the Shinhan booth just to tell them how much I like their paints and that I use them in my classes because my local store has a really good deal on them so I can afford to use them for my students. And uh, I like their faces just lit, lit up when I told them that. I guess they don't hear that too often. So they were like Aww. loading me down with stuff. I wasn't expecting oh, anything. I just wanted to be like, Thank you for making a quality product at a price point that I can use when I'm teaching classes. I thought they needed to hear that kind of praise. Oh, that's awesome. I've discovered their gouache. I bought the 12 sets. I was trying, I've been trying to do a compilation of gouache sets and like trying to find the smaller sets that a company offers, like Mm -hmm. as they're mixing sets Mm -hmm. and see kind of what's the best or what, what are ones that are good to combine together. And, um, Shinhan had a set of 12, which were very affordable. I mean, I think I paid more like $45, but I've seen it for 33 cents, but it has a wonderful color range. It's probably more colors than you need, but, um, it performed very well. And I did a light fast test on it and one color faded and oddly it was one that had a supposedly had a permanent pigment and it. it was it was a pv14 um violet like an ultramarine violet mm-hmm. and that one faded but like the red that was had kind of like a suspect color didn't fade which was weird mm-hmm. but i was really impressed with that and i was glad because i really enjoyed working with them and i was bummed it when i thought that because i didn't i didn't research the pigments before i bought it i'm just like i mm-hmm. want the smallest mixing set they have i want to review it so i was really bummed out because i loved working with it and then come to find out at least on my you know sketchy unscientific light fast test it performed pretty good so i was pretty pleased with that and yeah the the water markers man they i'm glad they're going to be getting more presence in america because they do a good quality product for a low price me too especially because while copic was there i felt like they and this is just how i felt i didn't feel like they were 
really serious about being there this year. Like they've split from the company that now does Olo and Olo had like a big setup. Um, but Copic had this little setup off to the side and I know they're flying everything in from Japan, but Meng Yeo flew everything in from Korea. Shin Han flew everything in from Korea. Some of the Chinese vendors like Art Secret was there. They flew everything in from China. Copic had no markers out. They had no refills wow. out. They had... I mean, every time I passed, I they had like TV screens and that was basically it. They didn't have anything to uh, let, I, and, and maybe it's because in the US at this point, Copic has become really ubiquitous. So maybe they don't feel like they need to sell, but I haven't seen much innovation from Copic in a while. So I'm really excited to see some of these other brands trying to kind of get that toehold into the market. I was kind of disappointed that Ohuhu wasn't there because they're just so popular with my students. It would have just been like as um like an introductory marker. They're great. And I think more stores would be interested in that, especially because Prismacolor isn't doing the open stock um, markers anymore. That's true. I think um, Ohuhu has done more uh, direct-to-consumer selling. Mm -hmm. I did see that the Mary Artist, I think they're in Michigan, they're selling Ohuhu. They have it on their on their website, and they're a brick-and-mortar store as well. Cheap Joe's does, too. We were just at the one in Asheville, and they are selling the Coda markers, both open stock and in little sets. That's right. I, I reviewed the uh, 120 set. I got it around Inktober time, and that's a nice little set. I feel like it could have a little bit more diversity in the blues and mm -hmm. maybe a few or more oranges, but it's a it's a really good palette. It's um it's not the neoprene nibs. It's the uh, the nibs like the Ohuhu has that mm -hmm. kind of compressed fiber. But um but it's a pretty pretty well well rounded collection. Um, uh, Jerry's Artorama is doing their version too, which is. Uh, Artify, Artify markers, and they have refills, which is, I think, which gives them a little bit of an edge over, um, and over I the think Coda markers currently. Artify is a rebrand of Potentate, which is, I can't tell if Superior makes Potentate or they're all in like an umbrella company. Interesting. Yeah, the the shape of the markers is kind of unique. They're um, they're tapered, and the uh, well, they're a brush nib and a a brush nib and a chisel nib and they've got this uh kind of like oval table tapered barrel that's pretty mm -hmm, comfortable to hold mm -hmm. and their their bottles look like the ohuhu wide markers which is interesting it looks like it uses the same body as the ohuhu wide marker like their refill bottles mm -hmm. so i always wonder like are they related somehow or you, you never know it yeah. seems like a lot of a lot, a lot of companies well we know a lot of companies are the same are yeah. producing for other if, if i had the money there's interest in me doing like a massive cheap marker thing but it's so expensive to do that and to like because i don't know enough people in the area that i can be like hey i see you have some shuttle art markers and some art and fly arty fly markers and i have some ohuhu markers and could just swatch it out i'd have to buy them all but there's mm -hmm. been interest in doing that and i would also like to you can find refills on aliexpress but it doesn't say what brand they're for and i have a running theory that they're all using the same inks maybe with a different body variation but I can't test that. Well, I I know if you look at the numbers on a lot of the the cheaper markers, like you'll see number 88, which is like the same purple across all the lines. And you'll see mm -hmm. like number 45, which is the same green. And it, they seem to cor correlate with the, the Shin Han colors, actually. So I don't know mm -hmm. if they're if they private label the ink from Shin Han or they're just kind of copycats because that might be really popular where they're from. But um, I did notice that like the Artix markers and other four or five other other ones, probably more, that they fell along the same marker ink colors as the Shinhan markers. So that's why I figured if there was a marker that I absolutely loved, that I would just go ahead and buy a refill. But um, since I do review a lot of products, I haven't run out of markers yet, so I haven't had to. Yeah, it's too bad you don't live next door. I'd be like, come on over, take some markers I, with you. <laughs> I honestly, I would love that because... Um... Uh, when I lived near other artists, it was so much easier for me to review stuff because we were always trading art supplies. And now most of the artists I know are my students. So they borrow from me, but it's not like it can be a two way street right now. Maybe one day, right? Planting those seeds. Right. I did a comparison of 28 different alcohol markers like four or five years ago. And there's, there's even been more since then. So it's, 
It's wild, the amount of variety. I really feel like Copic dropped the ball when these new companies started coming out. They, It's like they did everything they could to handicap themselves because they got rid of the wide marker. Now they only sell an empty version. They made their refills half the, half the size or a third yeah, of the size. They're like the size and of and, a chow. Yeah, and charge the same amount of money. Yep. So it's like... It's what do you expect people to do? They're not going to keep you're making your product less and less valuable. Meanwhile, there's all this competition coming in that's creating great products for less money. And then the kicker was recent Copic markers, Copic sketch markers have minuscule cracks in the cap and the people's markers are drying out within six months of them buying them. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's. Yeah, it's huge in the probably like in the crafting world. A lot of people are coming to markers yeah. uh, recently, and they want to start off with the best. They don't want to buy twice. They don't want to buy a budget brand and then love them, and then end up having to buy Copics. And then they're buying these Copic markers. Or sometimes I think they um, they get them when some of the big box stores clearance everything because yeah. they clearance them so often just to keep fresh stock. I guess I know and there's also everything a lot of artists in six who months. like they switch to Poscas and they'll sell off their whole marker collection too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. That may, honestly, I think if you could find somebody's old marker collection, you'd be better off That'd if be you want Copics. Yeah. Yeah, and then just buy the refills as you need them. Um, but yeah, that really, I think that was the 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 nail in the coffin for me with Copic was when they changed their refill size to half the size with no warning. At least the least they could have done was just be like, hey, we're going to be changing this and then give everyone a chance to, you know, stock up. But yeah, yeah it's I, I think it's ridiculous. Um, and well, then the cost Japan, of like their- too. They have more support yeah. for younger artists. They have all these cool books out. They have like events and things. And that never, tra- no matter how big the fandom is over here for it, it doesn't get brought over here. Not since um, when Imagination International was distroing Copics, they would do big events at AX, uh, Anime Expo in California or at NYCC, which gets people to try these. It gets them to see how they compare to other markers. It, it creates a lot of brand loyalty. And when it reverted back to the heirs, they ceased to do all of that. So you have younger artists who are starting with Ohuhu because Ohuhu <laughs> sent a lot of markers to art and in- younger art influencers. So, I mean, that makes sense to me. And they stand by the product and they keep, they keep innovating, yeah. which is not something that Copic has been doing. I almost thought, I think about the time they broke up with um, the uh, Imagination International, is that, that's the name of the company, right? I think so, yeah. Uh, that about the time they, they severed ties with them, I was wondering, it's like, are they not making enough money now that there's this new influx of cheaper markers and they need to keep, they, they got to cut out the middleman or what's going on there? So that's what I thought. I, I saw that breakup as being kind of like, a, we're cutting out the middleman. We're going to sell direct to the stores in America and not have to go through a distributor and either keep some more profit or maybe they were, maybe they just couldn't. Maybe they weren't making enough, but I find it hard to believe that their $7 markers can't make money next to a 50 cent marker. You know, it just doesn't seem to make sense to me. Well, when they went to their own distribution, in terms of stores, we lost a lot of color options. Some stores don't carry chow at all. Some stores only carry it in the big sets. So we lost a lot of that support that made them more competitive. And speaking of though, they made their own competition because Imagination does the Olo markers, and they were they were there. Really? Yeah. Oh, Imagination. Yeah. They, yeah, they, yeah. yeah. Are they the same company that does um the the Korean Korean markers? I don't think so. I think that's a Polish company. Oh, okay. Because they I, might I distribute they were, they them were. through Marker Universe, though. Yeah. Hmm. I haven't tried any of those, but people seem really pleased with those that have used. They're nice. The they're a, they're a water based marker, so um, you know the problems that come with a water based marker. If you're going to do them as like a watercolor water based marker, they're really nice, but the brush will eventually kind of start to tear up the paper. Oh yeah, that does that does tend to happen, and I think they might even do they have like acrylic marker as so. well. It's yeah, well they the advertise marker. it as like a pigment or like a opaque marker, but I'm thinking it's probably acrylic. Have you tried the Olo markers? I did. Uh, I did. I didn't like them. And I did not realize so many people identified with a marker brand that was so new to the market. My my comments oh, wow. were on fire. There were a lot of people who thought I did not know how to use markers at all. Oh, wow. Well, that's really interesting because it, the Olo markers, I don't know if they were 
marketed in the fine art world as much as they were in the crafting world, but they oh. were um, heavily marketed in crafters. They had um, people were like jumping in, buying in, like buying the entire sets plus refills. Like when they launched, mm-hmm. I think they might have kickstarted or something. They they had a pre order um, thing, yeah. I I didn't kickstart it, but I bought in with the pre order because they had Shihiro Hao, who is a big. She does great marker work, and she used to be a Copic ambassador. Her art is gorgeous. They had her talking about how these were such an improvement over Copics. And I love her art and I've been following it for years. So I bought it hook, line, and sinker. What didn't you like about them? So they are, I wish I had one handy. They're double-sided markers. Theoretically, if the build quality was better, they might be cooler. But they're double-sided markers in that you connect two half of a marker together to make your full marker so it's two tiny ink reservoirs and you do have a lot of options for like your nibs but my problem was they felt really flimsy and uncomfortable in my hand and they triggered my arthritis really bad because Ah. of that like that little bendiness and I was like kind of self-adjusting so it wouldn't snap in my hand because I'm heavy-handed um so that's what I didn't like about them they're also kind of expensive yeah, they're expensive. I like the idea of the dual ended, like where you can get two brush tips mm-hmm. or you can do two chisel or one or the other. But I thought, well, that would be cool if you could do like a dark and a light. So you could do mm-hmm. your blending, you know, your blending combinations. Um, Letroset used to have a blending set, which I really loved. Letroset's no longer with us, but uh, or at least they're not doing markers anymore. They sold to Windsor Newton. Um, but I loved that simplicity of yeah. having that kit that had like two shades of each color. It was very easy to use, fun to use. And, um, but with the Olaf's thing, it just seemed very gimmicky. And I didn't like that you had to buy a whole other plastic cartridge when you went, the yes. ink went dry. Yes. There was, it yes. just felt a little like, a little too gimmicky, a little too proprietary. I can't just refill this. I have to go buy a whole other thing. How is this saving any sort of plastic? You're throwing That's these. That's what I didn't like to. Like, yeah. I see a lot of that. Um, did yeah. you see a lot of, uh, like eco branded uh, products at the show this year? So, yes, uh, I, w- I want to be hesitant in how I say this because I think some decisions are a decision in the right direction in terms of packaging, moving to metal tins that are reusable. I love that. Moving away from plastic clamshell or plastic and cardboard throwaway combos. I love that cardboard all cardboard packaging is starting to become more of a thing i was really happy to see that so like in some instances i think those are good improvements just in terms of like studio storage where you have this metal tin and you can just put more of that same item in there you know um i have some concerns with some of the companies that are talking about how they're using recycled plastic in making paints because I know plastic recycling isn't where everyone says it is. We're not as efficient at recycling plastic as companies claim. So I'm more hesitant about that. Yeah, I noticed um, there was a company that said they were making their, because I mean, like, I stock the uh, the, the creativation, like, while it's going on. I, I'm always looking to see if anyone's posting any photos or videos or whatnot. And I saw, I think it was PBO that had a, or maybe it was Liquitex. Somebody had a uh, a tube that was made partially of cardboard for acrylic paints. Interesting. I didn't see that must have been Fabio and I didn't make it to them. I think you could do it, but you would have to go through that acrylic quicker and you would still need like a wax liner. Yeah. So it's like, I I think some stuff is just, I don't know, it feels a little greenwashy. Like, Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that they're doing that, but it just seems like I want my paint to last until I use it up. If yeah. if switching to a more eco-friendly packaging that you can't recycle because it's going to be covered with acrylic paint is going to make my paint only last a year on the shelf instead of three years on the shelf. That's more then waste. It's more waste. Um, I did see Liquitex had a, a canvas made with plastic bottles. Did you see that? Yeah, I did. And we talked to them about it because they're, uh, we talked to the coal arts people in general and they were just showing us everything that's new. Um, I am not a big acrylic painter. So 
I don't know. I, a lot of cheaper canvases do have like a plasticized coating. You know what I mean? Like it's not true gesso. It's more like a, a white acrylic paint. Right. Or even even gesso you buy on the store now is acrylic based. It's got the acrylic binder in it. Yeah, yeah. Versus, yeah. Um, I think it, I think that actually might be kind of cool. I wonder what their stretcher bars are. I wonder if they're yeah. keeping a wooden stretcher bar or if they're doing like a metal or if they're doing so wood. from what it they seems like told something us, you don't want to rot making making something you don't want to rot out of plastic seems yeah. like a great I, great use for old plastic recycled plastic yeah. i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt oh you. no oh. no uh from what i understood when we talked to them and i had a migraine the whole show so who knows uh um they're not for those they're not changing a whole lot and they are going to be available as a roll so you can stretch it yourself so if you bought like an aluminum plate you could wrap it around that Oh, that's great because I know that I've had uh, canvases that I don't paint with acrylics too often. And I sometimes I'll just be experimenting and it is, you know, it's not great and I'm not going to hang it up and it's like got thick paint. So I'm not going to sand it down so I can take the canvas off and then I just put fresh canvas mm -hmm. on. But I actually buy it at the fabric store. I'm not fancy, but that would be something that would be kind of cool because then you can use whatever you have. You can use old stretcher bars. You can mm -hmm. use, yeah, you can recycle old canvases that you don't like anymore. Just take that canvas off and put the new canvas on. So. It's kind of cool. They, I, and I've also seen some companies that have some sort of like earth paints or earth colors. And I do know anything about that. Well, not from Namta, but I do because I've been kind of stalking um, plant-based dye watercolors for five years now. And I've been slowly amassing a horde of them so I can talk about them. Like Ludia is developing a larger presence. Schminka has like their botanicals now. Um, <laughs> now, we both know when you're working with dye-based watercolors, including plant-based dye watercolors, they are probably not going to be super light fast. And I think they're more doing it as an appeal to whimsy for the most part, rather than like, this is a big innovation. This is so much better than what's traditionally on the market. Um, I'm not even sure we could argue that they would be more eco-friendly because um, there's still some processes in most watercolor that are not super eco-friendly. Um, and it's not like these come, I mean, Ludia just does the plant-based stuff that I, as far as I'm aware of, but like Schminka is still going to be doing mineral-based pigments forever. Um, is that, is that what you were talking about? I'm sorry. Well, I didn't that, see and much also of that. No, um, I, I'm thinking of something I saw that was called like Earth Colors, and it might be, I know there's, uh, I think it might have been, oh shoot, now I don't remember, but there was one of the companies that were like cleaning up mining sites and like filtering like the sludge and getting the iron oxide out and turning that into paint, and they'd have like a three, who was that? Was that Schminka? It might have been Schminka with their Earth, uh, they have like a three set. Gamblin yeah. does something similar to that for their oils and for their acrylics. And I wish they would for their watercolor because yeah. I love I, don't those they kind have of a random weird... gray now? Don't they do Schminka a random gray does. for watercolor? And it's really pretty. Who does? Schminka. It's a really oh, nice, okay. like neutral ish gray. It's got some orange and some blue this year, and I really like it, but it's like a good kind of neutral. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really interesting. Um I'm trying to think if there's any other little, uh, any other green things. I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of, a lot of, uh, companies are thinking about that both to like reduce waste mm -hmm. just for a financial thing. It's good to reduce waste in their, in their processes, but also because people want that less packaging. And I love the trend and I'm seeing this trend on like products, a lot of products from Amazon, like from Artix is a, is one company I'm seeing it a lot from Huhu as well, but companies that sell their products in the storage that you would need for the products yeah, yeah. oh i'm like can i i can't hear oh, you i just said i love i just mouthed i love that i love when they do that <laughs> oh oh okay um yeah I, I just got some markers and they have um they're in a nice sturdy chipboard box and they've got a grid in the bottom and they're meant to store them upside down because they're a single-ended acrylic marker but then when you use those up you've got the box that you mm -hmm. can put other markers in and i think that's that's really nice that they're thinking about you know, somebody not having to buy a thing to store their things and not just having a piece of like a plastic clamshell that's going to be thrown away. So that's, uh, I, th I think more companies are doing that. And then they don't have to, you know, they're going to spend the money on the packaging anyway. You might as yeah. well 
spend it on something that's going to be useful to the consumer. So it might be how the companies pitched me. When we went to talk to people, we made it clear that we're not a store buying because immediately they would want to try to talk to us about how many units we can sell you. And I didn't want to waste, if, they're, if you're busy and you're making sales, I don't want to waste your time just talking to me, a YouTuber. Um, so we would always introduce ourselves first. And I had these, I can't believe I didn't grab one. I have these cute little magnets that supposedly everyone in the creative professional digi digital content creator thing was, we're all, we were all going to make one. But I, like everybody I gave one to was like super surprised that I was giving out magnets. So I, I guess I was the only one. But um, when I introdu introduced myself, I also would mention that I'm an art educator, both in person and on the internet, and that I talk a lot about accessibility. Uh, so I think when they were pitching me things, they were often, or we were talking about things for the channel, we were often talking about what my viewers might be interested in, or what my students might be interested in, or more accessible art supplies. So they may not have pinged me as somebody who is interested in eco-conscious art supply solutions. And I should have asked, I have a minor in earth environmental science, like I, I should have thought to ask. But I, have a, I had a migraine like, the whole time. Oh, that stinks. Uh, did you notice any other trends around the show floor when you were checking everything out? Oh, I'm sure I did. So we kind of, <laughs> on our first day, we went down the whole first aisle and we talked to like everybody. And we realized there was no way we could hit all of the booths we wanted to hit doing that. Because everybody had such interesting stuff. So uh, we kind of were more strategic the next three, two, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the next two days were more strategic. So I really focused on talking to people with watercolor paper, comic stuff, watercolors. Um, and my friend who came with me is a fiber artist. So she was really, she was the one who was like talking to Jacquard and like the more crafty side of things. Oh, geez. Things that I noticed. Um, there seems to be a movement towards alternative fibers, like Hanamula is doing a sugarcane paper now, and they've got, like, they've done the hemp paper, and they have an agave paper, um, and I think they have a, a bamboo paper as bamboo, well. Bamboo, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, a, <laughs> there's been a lot of, like, companies eating other companies, even more so than before. Um, what do you mean? Oh, well, like, Fila has acquired Mimery. My Mary, I'm, I'll never say it right. I'm so sorry. Um, and I, I don't know if that's like they acquired, acquired the company or if they're just a U.S. distributor. McPherson's had a huge, huge booth. They sell like every, anything you can think yeah. of. Um, so it seemed like. they're kind of like Notions Marketing where they, they uh, represent a bunch of different brands and they'll sell to the smaller stores that can't like open up a corporate account with like, say, uh, Derwent or Windsor Newton, or I, I don't know, they like a bunch of different companies. So if they just want to buy like four tubes of this color and they want to buy a couple tins of this, they can buy it through McPherson's or Notions. Those smaller amounts, you don't have to buy like a whole display or a whole, uh, whole thing through them, I think. I didn't really see alcohol marker stuff. Like even Shinhan hadn't brought their markers with them. Um, I've seen on TikTok people acting like Poscas have replaced alcohol markers and they're just that's so ridiculous because they're two totally very different things um maybe as like the new hotness in the moment but like if you like markers they're just very different things but i didn't see vendors really selling a lot of markers um i didn't see any digital art stuff and that was a little surprising to me like i didn't see tablets i didn't see tablet accessories i didn't see stylus anything like that or mounts like uh Cintiq uh Wacom wasn't there which I kind of would have thought they might have been um didn't see any like computer programs like Clip Studio Paint wasn't there uh not that I necessarily expected them to be but you know um I feel like I should I wonder how many stores sell the technology nowadays when um well you know like selling the tablets and selling the software is when you usually buy software digitally now yeah. and and they're buy, selling it direct to the consumer so it might not but there were amazon much. there were some like blick reps there a couple of amazon reps there from what i'd oh, heard wow. um so there were like big chain reps there like joanne's mm -hmm. had reps there and like they bought the glowforge stuff with 
various amount of integrations on the stores. So I was kind of surprised not to see more of that. There was somebody who sold, um, they had, they had like a laser printer and they were doing some dye sublimation stuff, but they mostly sold the printers and the accessories for it. That was the most techie stuff I really saw. Like Cricut wasn't there, Brother wasn't there. I think those big companies, yeah, that's where the brother's not there because it seems like brother always has, well, they always had a huge presence at Creativation. Um, But I wonder if it's because there's so few stores now and and the big box stores have taken over so much and they have like aisles, like Mm -hmm. you go into even Walmart and there's like aisles of cricket materials. And it seems like in the big box stores that are in my, in the city closest to me, there's for crafting supplies, there's like hardly any stamps or dyes or stamp pads. And there's like three aisles of cricket stuff. And then there's like an aisle of stickers and, you know, some cardstock, but there's not the variety that they used to be because like, it feels like home decor and cricket have taken over so much of the big box stores. It's like, it, it's almost like there's not much of a point to go unless you know, it's, a you know, they're going to have what you want. It's, mm-hmm. it's so, it's just, it's frustrating because unless it's coming in a, in a box and I can understand that these stores are going to make more money and be able to keep the doors open longer, I think get more people to come in and beginners are a much bigger audience than people that have been working in a craft for a certain amount of time and need those specific things that they're only going to sell one of, you know, a year, but still it's just a little frustrating. You know, if you want to go and see something in person that, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing new, but I get it. It's a tough, it's a tough, uh, tough sell out there i'm i'm seeing that down here as well with our michaels and our joannes uh i basically don't even go to those stores anymore unless i'm going for floral stuff i'll just go to my local brick and mortar which i I love them so they're like a hoarder's den of art supplies but i love them so much they've got everything i got to go to two art supply stores in portland when we were down visiting my daughter at school and it was so wonderful. I bought like individual pastels and yeah, I got like, I like this much, this much uh, supplies and I spent $60, <laughs> but it was so fun. It was so, so fun just to pick through everything and, and uh, just see it all and get exactly what I wanted. And, uh, and I that art had, supply well, maybe it's good smell. that we don't have them up here. <laughs> What's that? And that art supply smell. Yeah. My husband oh, tried so to good. buy me for my birthday art supply smell candles because they make bookstore smell they don't smell like bookstores uh but he (laughs) he could get me a bookstore smell candle and to me like in art if you just did the crayon smell that would be good enough like it doesn't have to smell it would be good to easy to do with a candle i would think it's made with wax yeah yeah just there's an idea for your etsy shop (laughs) (laughs) not no not me no Honestly, if you would interview some an Etsy artist about what's going on with Etsy, that would be super interesting. Because every time I flirt with going back, everyone's like, please don't, don't do that. Please don't. It's so sad. It seems like almost everything on the internet has gone that way. Like it starts out really good. It starts out with pure intentions and then it just gets ruined. It gets ruined by money and by, well, what I think happens is these companies start up and they need to... They they have a lot of venture capital money, so yeah. they can you know entice people in with low fees, and they can they, and there's not many people on the platform yet, so there's more shoppers and there are vendors, and and it's great for a while, but then the company needs to raise cash fast, so they raise the fees and they just let anybody sell instead of vetting their people, and then before you know it, it's just a drop shipper, you know paradise basically, and the people that are trying to sell their handmade goods are comp- are competing against stuff that was mass produced in countries with poor labor practices for a tenth of the price. So mm. it's frustrating. One thing that I've been, that I did see a couple times in, in people's videos was faux encaustic paint, like paint that's acrylic paint that's meant to look like encaustics. And I know Arteza is doing a set of them, but I saw Deco Art had a really beautiful looking paint and I don't know how new it is, but Blick is carrying it. It's expensive. It's like $9 a jar and I'm not sure how big the jar is but it looks really beautiful. It's just like sheer and translucent and it looks like, like the wax. Like, yeah. Plastic interesting. Paint. See, um, I have cats and I'm super clumsy. So like, while I've always been like a little interested in encaustic, I know it will result in a fire or a burnt cat or mm-hmm. a burnt me. I didn't see. So I have started watching some of the other people who have done NAMTA. So I'm kind of getting caught up on like what we missed because there is so mm-hmm. much there and we spent so 
much time. Like we spent like an hour at the Holbein booth. So, you know, we missed a lot of stuff. Hey, you gotta go where where you're the most interested. You don't owe you don't owe us anything. Oh no, <laughs> you're, no. you're uh, yeah. that's actually um somebody pointed out to me that I'm one of the few ones who really focused on art supplies while at NAMTA. So I think that's kind of cool because if all of us kind of focused on what we're specifically interested in, then that makes all of these viewpoints on NAMTA interesting because there's going to be people who cover what other people were not able to cover. Yeah, I really appreciate it because there was so, there's always a lot of craft coverage. Actually, not that much this year. Back in the heyday, you'd have like 50 people posting videos from all the booths and stuff. Well, they Um, had an interesting photography and videography policy. And um, we tried to be really good about it. So that might be why there were fewer people posting about it. While we were walking the floor, I we only encountered one other person that we knew was there at, to do coverage. Mm-hmm. Did you, was that other person doing the art supply stuff or more no, of the craft supply no, stuff? No, uh, they were a writer working for, I think, scrapbooking.com or something like that. My friend made good friends with them and I was sick the whole weekend. So I was like, Oh man, that's too bad. I hate it when when I'm ill or injured or something, and I there's something I want to do, and I'm like kind of suffering through it and doing it anyway because I want to do it. But oh, that's that's frustrating. I think that uh, you usually see more more crafters covering these events because the churn of craft supplies is much greater. Like every it used to be a lot a lot more frequent because there were a lot more companies. But mm-hmm. American Crafts has come in and bought up a lot of the smaller they labels. They had a huge but, display. Oh, did they? Because yeah. I didn't see anything from American Crafts from anybody. Wow. Wow. Um, I don't know that yeah. they had a lot new necessarily. They had a magnetic cutting board that I was kind of interested because like as a comic artist, I can like snap the ruler down and it'll stay. Oh, that's nice. Um, but I didn't see like anything that I was like, oh, I've never seen this before. Such innovation. Mm-hmm. I think American Crafts bought We Are Memory Keepers, didn't yes, they? Yes, I think so. And that was, they usually come up with some good stuff. Yeah. I have a lot of that as like my, um, like rulers or like stuff for my arc ring binder. Mm-hmm. And I think at one point they bought, uh, they bought EK success, but I don't think EK success is still around. I think they bought it and closed it down as far as I remember. I know for a while they were, EK success was doing the Martha Stewart stuff. I wonder if that just got subsumed, subsumed by the Martha Stewart uh. line. Oh, maybe, maybe. I know they had a lot of their own, uh, their own punches and tools mm-hmm. and stuff. And then, or, or maybe because it was so close to We Are Memory Keepers doing like very similar tools that maybe they just kind of like decided to pick, pick one and have one, you know, one uh, active and just let the other one go away. Because like they also, because like EK Success and Inka Dinka Do were all owned by the same company too before they were bought by... Um, by American Crafts, so and now Inka Dinka Do is no longer around. They're a rubber stamp company mm-hmm. and like have stamping tools and stuff like that. So that was that was interesting. But I with um a lot of the craft companies is because I think because the craft world is a lot smaller, especially nowadays, that a lot of the companies will release stuff every month, release more and more and more because they've got a smaller pool of people to to consume their materials, and then. If you only buy stuff when you run out of it, then you're not going to be buying that much and all these stores are going to fold. So they've got to keep churning out new stuff to keep people buying and keep the doors open. Um, And that's what I'm seeing with most of the stamp companies online. And well, I mean, American Crafts, they sell the bigger, the bigger companies, but still, I mean, you got to have fresh stuff on the store shelves if, you know, people are going to buy it. Uh, have you been noticing and like a lot of consumerism in the art supply world as well? Or? I'm going to two part answer that. So I went like as a YouTube person, I do always want to see what's new, but as an artist, I wanted to ask some of these, not necessarily the product reps, but there were some like company owners there. I wanted to be able to ask them some questions. So that was one of the reasons that I was really interested in going. Um, I think, I feel like during the pandemic and for a little while after in the more arts sphere, and I don't consider what I do fine art, so I'm not even going to speak to that. um, There was a really big consumerism push. Uh, Tons, and I I fall into this too, but like tons of haul videos. And some of those haul videos were like 
hundreds of dollars worth of stuff that they bought sight unseen from like Dick Lake, things like that, you know? Um, I think in terms of the audience, people are getting tired of seeing that, which I relate to, but it's a little frustrating because they don't want to watch tutorials either. So now it's like figuring out what you want to share with your audience that they'll be interested in and how comfortable are you either because like I'm not an entertainer I'm a teacher and I am an artist and I'm a comic artist but I'm not like I don't want to do skits <laughs> you know like that's not why I'm doing YouTube um and I think I love channels that do do skits but like I don't want to do skits and I don't want to do video essays because I don't want to spend six weeks researching before I even start doing a thing I'm not I didn't go into art history so it's going to be an interesting time for those of us who make art YouTube videos to figure out what we want to do with our channels especially if there is a pushback against um some of like the really rampant consumerism like I, I don't know anyone personally so I'm mostly just talking about myself and some of the temptations that I've seen but like Theoretically, if a company reaches out to you to sell a product and you have an affiliate code, you have somewhat of an interest financially in that product selling, right? And your audience at this point is probably aware of what affiliate codes mean. So there's, because there's so many people who are really, really broke right now, and I live in a part of the country that is really, really hit right now because flood insurance is just really high and like people got a lot of storm damage so um i think as things get financially harder for individuals who are working or people are leaving bad job situations or people are leaving jobs to become artists and then it's not panning out the way they were promised i'm worried there's going to be a lot of pushback if we're not we as art youtubers are not more careful and you know i think that pushback is warranted to I be do honest too, yeah. i after that, uh, that my my trips to the two art stores in Portland with my little bitty sixty dollars worth of pastels or you know random things I bought um, on my Snapchat video last week, I asked, "Do you guys want to see it? Do you want an icky haul?" And they're like, "Yeah, bring it on. We want to see what you bought." And um, so I did. I did post that, and I think I've used everything that I bought already, like at least oh, like good. a few times. I've, yeah. I've done like three paintings with the with one of the courses, three paintings with another one. I've used the pastels. But, um, but I think because I think if you're going to do a haul, you have to do it responsibly mm -hmm. and you have to make sure people are aware that, um, you bought this because you, like, I bought some Karen Dosh pastels. I wanted to try mm -hmm. them, but I didn't want to invest, you know, $50 yeah, in a small way. set. Yeah. I'll yeah. I just wanted to try a few. And, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and I know if I order open stock on Blick, then I'm not going to just buy three pastels. I'm going to be buying enough to hit that free shipping. I just yep. know myself. Yep. So I want going to a local store is perfect. I get to try a bunch of different little things. I'm supporting the local business, yep. keeping somebody employed. They're nice people. It's, you know, it's just so nice. And so people were, were here for it because they were, they wanted to see these different things. They were curious about it too. They have advice to to give like oh i tried that this worked but this didn't or they'll give tips for like how to get the best use out of that product so i think as long as you as long as people approach it in a giving way like um what do you want to see mm -hmm. if i use this because if you're posting it on youtube you're posting it to hopefully benefit other people mm -hmm. and if you know somebody says oh yeah i'm curious about that could you show me how that works on this paper or could you show me how this and that and i think that if we as you know, artists on YouTube do post a haul, we got to be respectful of what our audience wants because that's kind of the agreement where <clears throat> we're entering in with them. Like I'm showing you this stuff and I know that this video is going to get a lot of views mm -hmm. because it's a haul video and YouTube pushes the haul it, videos it does, to yeah. the audience. People that like subscribe to me will go to their homepage and they won't see any of my tutorials, but they'll see like a sat chat or a haul or whatever YouTube wants to push out for whatever yeah. reason. And I think they push haul videos because they really are trying to get their YouTube shopping. Yep, um, it's yep. kind of like TikTok shop. Yep. They're trying to get YouTube shopping rolling. So they want to get people that want to buy stuff. They want videos in front of those people that they think are going to entice them. So I think it's it's on us as creators to make sure that if we do post a haul, that we are giving people value and we're taking their 
request into consideration. Obviously, we can't do everything that everybody asks. But if somebody's like, geez, I, I don't have that much money to spend. How, does that work on this paper? Because that's a paper I have. And I've, I've been curious about it and, and to be mindful. But when you, what, if you, there's a, there are channels out there, especially in the crafter sphere, where every video is a haul. And yeah. it's like, and then sometimes it's like, oh, my God, all I hear, all I see is hauls from this channel. And I'll click on the channel and I will see there are tutorials there mm-hmm. and they never the, yeah. the tutorials never get pushed to yep. me. But there are also channels which are just hauls. And I kind of don't blame them on the for the fact that they could spend a hundred dollars on these products to yeah. do a haul and make a hundred dollars yeah. between affiliate codes and the YouTube ads. So it's kind of like a wash for them, but it's not a wash for these people that are watching it. They're thinking that this is normal to have this much to yeah. buy this frequently. And, and they buy it. Oh, they said it's great. I'm going to buy it too, but maybe they swatched it and then put it on the shelf. I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of like, re- I'll work and review a product and do a couple paintings. And then on the shelf, it goes into my museum of art supplies to be picked up at hopefully some other later date. So yeah, I need to check myself on that because I don't want to be encouraging people to buy more than, than they can use because yeah. you don't want it to go bad on the shelf. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think that there's, there's a rightful grateful pushback to the I, I do too my concern is what you pointed out where people will have other type they'll have tutorials and they'll have overviews and they'll have like gener really generous content that youtube just doesn't promote but they'll still be a recipient of the backlash on some of the videos i've done that people didn't like and they're they're free to not like anything i do that's fine they won't watch anything else i do so I am worried, not so much for myself with the haul videos, but like my concern would be an assumption that because that's what YouTube promotes, that's all we do. And then there'd be a reactionary backlash mm-hmm. against that to people who are, um, and I, I say this with love and I say this coming from such a place and having been in such a place, they're hurting, they're struggling. And now they're seeing somebody who they used to watch for comfort and all they do is, is mm-hmm. spend money on these things that they can't afford. Mm-hmm. Oh, I think that's huge. I think that's a huge thing. And I'm sure, I'm sure I've been guilty of it. I, um, because it's fun to get new supplies it is, and, yeah. and that impulse you're so, control and you're is re- hard. Yeah. And you are rewarded by posting a haul video. It's very, it's very tempting to want to do that. Um, I, I like the one that you did before you were doing the watercolor showdown and you like gathered up the palettes that you had bought to review. I think that's super helpful because I think it's helpful in two ways. For one, it kind of puts it on my ra- radar. It's like, oh, yeah. I've never seen that before. I'm curious about it. I have no plans on buying it because I have so many cheap Good. watercolor I bought a palettes lot of as it is. But I want to see it, you know? And then so it reminds me, it's like, I've got to check back on her channel if it you doesn't get promoted to me. Um, and, and I'm that's, a subscriber and I don't see everything. Um, I'm going to check back and see if I can find that. So I think I that's still do hauls is usually yeah. like a, Hey, if I bought this for me, but if you guys want to see me talk about it, I'll do a dedicated video about it. Let me know in the comments. Or like, if you want to know how this handles, let me know that as well. Uh, I bought, so that circling back to that showdown, I bought so much stuff that was garbage. Um, not because I like reviewing bad stuff, but because it was budget. And I know that's the first thing a lot of people go for. And that's going to be the stuff I never go back to. And I never use that's the stuff I feel kind of guilty about is I have a, it's not a big cabinet, but I have a cabinet of these terrible watercolor palettes that I need to just gut the paint out of them and use them as palettes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's frustrating because if you buy something that you don't like, and then what do you do with it? Because you don't want to, you don't want to, you know, force it on somebody else right, to yeah. use. It doesn't have anything else. And they're like, well, I guess I'm not into colored pencils because these are garbage. Right, or I guess right. I don't like watercolor because it's, and, and like you're, and not to say that young children don't deserve great products, but I mean, it could be a fine quality for somebody to just do some doodling or whatnot, but then the toxic chemicals, you don't know right. what these where these products are made and uh and what's in them and do you trust the non-toxic label on there where'd you buy it right. I mean, there's just you know there's just so many issues there so then it does go to waste unless you gut it and reuse the palette some of those palettes are so cute though so right right it would um, be worth reusing but i because like i i have this guilt because i just went to this art supply convention where we actually weren't really allowed to buy stuff So I didn't come home having bought a bunch of stuff. I think on the last day they could give you stuff or they could 
like sell you stuff so they didn't have to buy it back. But I didn't really buy a lot of stuff there because it just wasn't for sale. Um, but I still have this guilt, like thinking about my channel in the upcoming year and like knowing where people's finances are going. How do I feel about being like, look at this new shiny and that new shiny. And I'm really excited about this new shiny and you guys should buy all of it. Do you, are you just speaking of the fact that you, you're sharing videos from Manta or just your general content? Um, you know, it's both. Um, so, so I have a lot of stuff in my to review cabinet that I bought at, on Black Friday and on Prime Day last year. So I bought them on sale and it actually takes me a really long time to do reviews for some things because I'm, I do like a watercolor illustration with it and that, those take a few days and um it, that's like slotting it into my schedule to have time to do it so i have stuff that like it's just taking me longer to get to and it's not like i went and just bought it but i realize like the optics of my release schedule it may look like i'm i am buying a bunch of stuff constantly and constantly trying to push i don't know i just became like really hyper aware of it recently so it's like been on my mind and i've been like self-reflecting about it I don't think it looks that way because um, you're not, and my viewers understand this too. I think, I hope, um, I know when you're buying all of those palettes, say that for the watercolor showdown, yeah. um, obviously you're going to buy stuff together to save on shipping, say like for both money and for the environmental, if stuff can be shipped together, it's going to be less, you know, bad, less packaging, carbon at least. footprinty. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I know you do the artwork and you do the field tests for everything. And I, I think my audience understands that too. I do at least one painting for each thing I review and usually a couple. And I use them for a couple times to make sure that I'm not in some like buyer's high when I'm first, like the, uh, the Da Vinci gouache, the first thing I painted with them, I was like, Oh, love it. This is great. And then like, as I got a little bit more critical and got dug in a little bit more and did some more testing, I'm like, Ooh, well actually, um, you know, so I can't just, I can't take that first like I'm excited for this thing and I yeah. have this thing now and everything is wonderful. You're in the honeymoon phase with this product. And then when you start to kind of, you know, put it pull through at the spaces. edges, pick at the string, you're like, Oh, that's a, that's a little bit of an issue. That's going to cause a problem. And then, um, uh, and especially when you really want to love something, like I really wanted to love that gouache because it's such a value for like the amount of you get for the amount you pay and the pigment information looked great. And I still, I think they use high quality ingredients, but it, kind of just miss the mark and it, you feel so bad because it's like oh I really wanted to love it you know so I think a, taking a couple chances or, or, or painting over a couple of days is really important for these reviews so you're not getting like somebody's having a bad day yeah. and they use this and their yeah. painting doesn't come yeah. good and you think it's junk or you're having a great day yeah. and you love it but then you know the next time you use it, it's like oh I guess I was just kind of in that you know blissful you know first time using this product i kind of feel like and... when i'm reviewing art supplies my goal should be that, that if they're having a bad day these should put working with these supplies should help them have a better day right like we turn to art to self-soothe we turn to art to express ourselves and if the supplies you're using are making you angry if they're making me angry when i'm reviewing them that's a warning generally i mean not every supply is for every artist right but like generally that's like a warning sign like because i want people who watch my reviews and watch my tutorials i want them to have fun in general i'm not always successful at that, but um that's like my overall goal is like a lot of us are buying this for ourselves as a treat it's a reward for ourselves or it's um like we had a bad week and we're gonna splurge on some watercolors and we're gonna paint something this weekend and i want even if they don't like what they painted i want them to have fun with the paint Absolutely. Yeah. I was uh, teaching a class at the library last night and I brought, um, I brought, because well, like the librarian like, what, what do you want me to buy for the class? It's like, no, no, I got it. It's like, I've got so much excess from different stuff. I'll just bring the supplies. And I brought cotton paper and the, I hadn't brought cotton paper for my students there because we usually use the Canson or the Strathmore watercolor greeting cards because it's a good yeah. project size to yeah. finish in a time but I had I actually had some uh Hannah Mule 100% cotton paper and I brought that and I mean, one of my students was like I am just like a way better painter this time you know <laughs> Yes. And I'm like, you're doing great. And you know, everybody's, everybody's painting look great. And of course they're, they're trying, they're doing an awesome job, but a good part of that was that there was, there, it was good painting, yeah. that was good paper. And there was this one woman who had a traumatic brain injury and, um, and she's like, 
you know, my therapist want, wanted me to come and try this. I used to paint and draw all the time. And I'm like, have fun. Follow along with me if you want. If you want to just sit back, chill out, have a snack, uh, that's fine too. And her painting came out great too. And I, you know, the combination of decent paint, great paper, you know, and, and it was so nice to see everybody like feel great. Yeah. And it's, and you can paint, you can paint well on cellulose paper. I, I use cellulose paper for different things, but what it didn't occur to me until recently was that it takes a certain skill to make cellulose yes. paper look good. Yes. And that didn't occur to me yes. for, for the longest I time. Wish they I think would it was Mitchell. differently. I wish it wasn't marketed right. as student grade because in fact, I have a video scheduled for Sunday about how to paint on cellulose because you are 100% right. Cotton rag is more cotton rag in a way is the student grade paper in that it is forgiving. Almost any paint will look good on a cotton rag. You can do more layers. You can do more lifting. You can do more scrubbing. Cellulose is temperamental. It really is. But if you're accustomed to it, it's not that big of a mm-hmm. deal. I had this uh, this uh, member of our community over on Facebook, and she painted on Canson XL, and she was doing these beautiful paintings. She's like, well, I'm going to use up this before I go buy a pad of arches. Or maybe she had a pad of arches, but she was going to use that up. Her work was so pretty on the Canson XL. She had adapted her technique mm-hmm. to work on that paper. Then when she went to the arches, she's like, I like the Canson XL better <laughs> because her just her work was so adapted to that. Yeah. And uh, it's like, and it's got such a, her, her style, like you can see her style has been somewhat informed by the paper yeah. and it's, it's really whimsical and it's, um, it's almost got, it's, it's very realistic, but it's not photorealistic. It's very representational yeah. and it's just, it's just delightful. You and so, and I can see it in a second that it's hers and it's just so nice to see, but she developed her, but I mean, you don't come out of the gate working on that paper and getting such great results on that note too like when i was coming up and learning watercolor because um, a friend taught me but i also learned from the internet it's not like i took watercolor classes no one was pointing out that they were working on cotton rag and i was working on cellulose so you can't replicate those techniques and it was driving me crazy and the friend was an illustrator so like they were using like illustration board and stuff for their watercolor. So they couldn't really tell me why I couldn't do like a really nice gradiated wet and wash wash on Canson Montal because it just doesn't tolerate it like that. No, I know exactly what you're talking about though. And it also kind of reminds me of why we review it's to help people find those like aha magic art supplies that are going to do it for them. And if you don't live near a store or a school where you can play with the materials, the internet is the only way you're going to be able to get close to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the student that was really excited about the paper, um, because I was painting on a block of arches, and I usually don't paint on arches um, for the library classes, just because I'm painting, uh, I could end up painting the painting several times, and I'm painting holding the board in front of me kind of backwards, so it's it's not my best work. And, um, but it's like, well, this is handy, It's I'm, gonna, I'm just going to use it. And so I was telling you, it's cotton paper. She's like, oh, I'm going to go buy some cotton paper. And I said, well, this pad right here, if you go to Michael's, it's going to cost you about $80. So what you want to do is, you know, I've told them about Blick and Jerry's Artorama and stuff, just because, you know, back in the day when they had the coupons for, for Michael's, then that way you yeah. could pay, you could buy the paper at a reasonable price. Yeah, I hate, I hate what they've done, how they've switched over to like a point system now. And I get like a random $5 yeah. coupon that has to be used in two days. Yeah, I wish it was more just just charge what it should what it should cost Especially rather than playing the games wait for sales. I don't like I mean that. I I help a lot of parents Christmas shop. Um that's like one of the not it's a free thing I do to help people out cuz I like helping their kids get good art supplies. And I'm um, I'm always like please not Michaels. Please not Michaels. Like if you live in your any art they are going to be so nice at any regular brick and mortar art supply they will help you out. Please don't go to Michaels. You're going to spend way too much Yeah, it's 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 too bad. I mean, on on one hand, I love that it's there. I love that we have that option because we have a yeah, Joanne's the accessibility, um, and Joanne's is nice. But it's if you're not sewing, it's not. I, they just don't have as much stuff that I'm going to be interested in. I sew sometimes, but I usually get my fabric elsewhere where it's it's uh, better quality. Um, so I really was excited when Michaels came in because we had an AC Moore and AC Moore. I don't know if you had those in no, your area, but I've but, been to. I had gone to uh, them once. Oh, I loved AC Moore. They had such variety and the great prices. The staff was nice. Now, the, the staff at Michael's is perfectly nice. They are, but the helpful. problem is they understaff on purpose. So you can't actually find somebody to help you. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it's I really was hoping and to be to be fair, the Michaels came in during the pandemic and I feel like they never really got the stock up to up to where it needed to be. I think they had so many problems getting getting their supplies in and stuff. So it was just I think they've kind of had a, a bit of a rough time here. So I feel bad um, saying that. But also, I didn't want to send my student in to spend uh Eighty dollars on something they could buy for thirty five. Well, not just online. that. Like I don't know about y'all's Michaels, but and I I wasn't this teenager, but I was friends with these teenagers. Our Michaels um, has put everything behind glass doors now because people would go in and like they would use the brush pins, but they'd abuse the brush pins because they didn't know better. So oh. the brush pins would all be broken. All of the Prisma colors that were open stock would had been dropped. All the paper people would touch the paper, like the arches that was out and like, wow. yeah. So my recommendation was like, also don't go to Michael's because you're probably, unless you're buying something in a box, you're probably buying damaged stock unless you know what you're looking for. Oh yeah, that's, that's too bad. Our Michael's in the marker aisle, they have a camera, like a yeah. closed sh- circuit type security camera, but I don't think... I don't think everything's behind glass, but I do know if you want like a set of pencils and you have to bring like a card to an associate to get to get it because it's not out there on the shelf. Um, so I'm not I'm not sure. I haven't gone in there too often, but I'll go into browse round occasionally or go in with a friend just uh, to see what's new. And uh, they have a pretty good selection of like kids stuff. It seems like like kids art supplies, but not much for crafts these days. Not not much for stampers or for um, paper crafters unfortunately but who knows maybe maybe the trends will change and they'll they will uh bulk it up a little bit but it was just neat to see their reaction to cotton paper and uh, i do like that there are some more affordable brands in arches now there's the uh, like the bauhaus yeah that's it's pretty and good a lot of brands are yeah and some brands are like needing is is branding that like they it's under their know. label so right. yeah have to get a block of block of cotton watercolor paper for 13 to 15 dollars is pretty sweet yeah, and I was buying the, um, the Blick Premier watercolor paper, too. That's what I do all my testing on because it was more affordable. Yeah, I, I right from the get-go, I started doing all of my swatching and testing for uh, my reviews on cellulose paper. Mm-hmm. I was using the Fabriano Studio 25% mm-hmm. cotton, 75% wood pulp paper for consistency mm-hmm. and also because it's cheap. Because, I mean, I imagine you must spend a fortune on cotton watercolor paper. Oh, it is. It is. Kind of, yeah, it is kind of pricey, yeah. I don't know that I is yeah. It's, it's great. And we did taxes recently. That's always fun. Okay, get those write offs. <laughs> yeah, right. My husband was like, "You need to go through the Amazon and put into Wave all the stuff you bought for the channel." Because like, I I'm not the best about remembering to do that. Oh, I actually print out my, I know you probably hate this as an environmental scientist, but look, I print look, out it, my you, receipts. You do what you gotta do. Yeah, I print out my receipt when I buy from Blick or Amazon, Cheap Joe's, Jerry's, and I have a folder and I just put everything yeah. in a folder. So when I'm preparing my taxes, I have everything right there. And then I take the folder with all of the, or I take all those receipts, I put them in a big envelope and I elastic band it to my tax return. So I have that if God forbid I'm ever audited. I've got everything. I have like the most well documented, <laughs> well documented things, so I don't get in trouble. But, uh, but yeah, it does add up, yeah. and uh, and it and it adds up even for me. And I will fully acknowledge that I get a fair amount of supplies sent to me for review. And I know that you you don't do reviews if you're sent the product, right. correct? Um, in fact, that so Yasutomo sent me some of their kits. So I'm going to have to be really mindful, like, and I've already disclosed this a few times, like, this isn't a review. This is just a demonstration. I I personally don't have a problem reviewing pro- products that are sent to me for free, mm-hmm. but I do disclose it right at the beginning of the video. This was sent to me for free. I disclose it in the video description. So if anybody wants to wait my opinion less because I was given it to free, if they think that I'm somewhat biased, if they, you know... I don't want, I don't think I am because it's very common for stuff to be sent. Just, I've been doing this for 13 years and, you know, not to brag or anything, not bragging like, I get this all the time, you know, but, um, but yeah, I I don't think it influences me, but, you know, just in case I just want to make sure there's absolutely no like secrets, but I wouldn't take money for review. And I do know there are channels that will take money for a review. For me, that is, that is unethical because if I'm taking money for a company 
then then they should be benefiting from that just on that because I, I come from t a tv and a radio background for profit tv radio so to me that's advertising and if you're going to take money and purposely yeah. not promote a brand and not do something that's in their best interest and that's unethical it's unethical to uh to lie to your audience for money so it's like i don't see any ethics any way you could take money for a review ethically but for product i i don't consider I don't know. I guess I don't. I don't see it as a value exchange when it's um. Yeah, because you're giving up your time is, uh, for the review too. I'm giving up my time. Yeah, and that does yeah, have value because it does take a lot of yeah. time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> um, um, but but otherwise, I mean, there's a lot of things I just flat probably wouldn't even bother reviewing because it's like, and I have a rule, and it's um, I either have to be really interested in the product. Or it's got to be something that I've had at least six people independently without knowledge of each other mm -hmm. ask me to review. So now that I'm saying this on, on camera, people might be like, ah, hey, everybody, go ask Lizzie to review this thing. But um, if, I, if I've if i had a few people ask me, can you review Paul Rubin's new watercolors? Can, you know, when I hear it from a bunch of different people, then if it's offered to me, I'll say yes. Or I might just go and buy it because uh, I don't need to wait around for a company to offer it. But if it's not something that I'm really interested in if there's enough people asking for it and it gets offered, then I'll, then I'll go for it. But I'm not purposely going to buy something I don't think I'm going to like yeah. just to review it because then I feel like I'm already kind of biased and it might be, if it doesn't like knock my socks off, I'll be kind of like, well, I didn't even want this thing and I bought this thing to review it and it was crap, you know, and then I'll be like, you know, kind of a little salty about it. So I try not to do that. I was a little salty about the Stabilo Woodies only because the price that they charge oh, for those. Yes, those look, uh... That's like Faber-Castell stuff. Like I want to like Faber-Castell stuff so much. I think they offer quality children's art supplies, but the price point they are at in the U.S. is I can't recommend them to parents at that price point. Which products exactly? Like the, some of their stuff is affordable, but the, some stuff is kind of high. The red stuff tends to get kind of pricey, and it starts to be oh, the really? same price as the gold Faber and the Faber line. So at that point, I'll just if I'm buy, if I'm buying like I bought my nephew a bunch of art supplies for Christmas, I will just generally go to the next level up unless I know there's like toxic stuff in it or like you know what I mean? Because like there is a reason to buy children's formulated art supplies because they tend to be more washable and more safe. And especially if they've got younger siblings who are going to be using the art supplies too, then it is really important. But if it's like a teenager with no younger siblings that I'm buying for, I'll just buy, if the price is that close, I'll just buy the professional grade for them. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think also, and we're, you're talking about the, in Japan, how they just, they uh, invest more into children's art and the prices are more reasonable. They also it just don't chase like... them out as quick as they do in the U.S. Like, okay, so I teach teenagers right now. Um, they're probably my favorite age group to teach. And all of their parents have contacted me to be like, well, they're not in talented art, which is, I don't know if you guys do talented art, but it's like a cherry pick. Oh, like gifted and talented? Yeah, yeah, but for art and you have to test yeah. into it and your teacher has to recommend mm -hmm. you. And spoiler, I didn't make it into talented art. I'm not bitter, but like I like to disclose that to tell my students, like it doesn't matter if your current art teacher thinks you're good enough if you put the time in, you can be the master of your own destiny. But uh, their parents will ask me, like, is it OK that they're not in talented art? Like, this is a library program, ma'am. We are an open club. Anyone who likes art is welcome to join. You do not need the school's special approval to join. Yeah, absolutely. I think that also in other, like, like Germany and uh, all across Europe and actually probably even a lot of Asian countries, they do not balk at the price of children's art supplies like we do in the United States as well. So like the, uh, well, the, the Stabilo Woodies they're they got picked up and popular by crafters. Mm -hmm. And I think they used to be about 20 bucks and now they're $40 for a set of 18. It was just, just kind of outrageous. And I can't imagine they're marketed to children. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine somebody spending $40 on a set of 18 crayons for their five-year-old. And I think they're marketed to younger, to younger children. So they must not be that expensive over there, but still more expensive than what people here are willing to spend on, say, a box of crayons. People are at most going to buy the 64 set of Crayolas for their kids, which is probably about, I don't know, eight bucks or something. It took some finagling I in a long time. to get the 128 yeah, set it, from my parents when I was a, a kid. They have 128? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. And I, I, that was that like, I, I begged for that every time we went to Walmart. Oh, wow. And, but I think that was probably about half of what the price of like 
one of the the kids line products in Europe would be yeah. would be a much higher quality higher quality product but yeah I was I was like I was like oh people want this so many people asked me to review it so I'm like all right I'm buying it and then I was like and then I like carve the end of it. I'm like, ah, it's not even all the way to the bottom. The lead doesn't even go all the way through these crayons. I was, I was so mad that I spent the money on that. But that was <laughs> that also, so was, I mean, so I get that. And I, I had to stop reviewing cheap stuff for that reason. Um, because I would just get so angry. And when I get, when I get in my, that space, I'll repeat myself a lot. And then people will think I'm more angry or more bothered than I actually am. And I just forgot I said it. Um, but it's good that you did that though, because that told your, like the people who are interested, don't torture yourself. But like, I can see the value of like, well, you, you cut them up and like, I'm sure no one else was willing to cut them up. Well, yeah, cause they're expensive. You don't want to be chopping into your own. If it's like, I'm like, I will do it for science because I was just, I was mad. I was mad. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, so, you know, yeah, I, I will, I will accept free product to review, mm -hmm. but I do, I do disclose it. So I, I don't know, I guess it's probably an ethical gray area, but I don't think it clouds my, my judgment, but it is, eh, people can decide. They it is easy to win me over. That's kind of the bigger problem. It's harder to genuinely tick me off and like me be mad mad at you. You'd have to hurt one of my pets or something or my husband. You come from my husband and we're done. Um, but it's it's easy to get me to like you so that's why in general i if i can afford it i prefer to buy it myself unless it's a product i have like from a company i've reviewed before and i typically really like their stuff anyway and then i'm more likely to say yes but if it's a company i've never worked with i would unless it's like a sample i'll always take free samples but i'd rather buy it and not be like one over because i am very easily influenced well, I can understand that because there is the uh, the theory of reciprocity, where if you if like salespeople use it all mm -hmm. the time, they will like they'll do something nice for you or they'll give you something. So then you feel like, well, I better give you something back, or they'll spend time with you. So you feel like I better buy something because they spent all this time on me. And so I can see that, like, if somebody sends you a product, you may feel like, oh, you know, they're this is coming out of their marketing budget, or they're sending this to me. To me to me to be nice so I better I should do something nice in return but I I don't I guess I guess because I've been doing this for so long I kind of know the deal they're not sending it to me to be nice they're not sending it to me because they like my artwork they are purely sending it to me because they hope I will show it on camera and they can get some sales so I guess I guess that jaded aspect that I have helps well, in that see, in that, res that respect my problem is years ago when I ran the blog I would actually reach out to companies sometimes, especially companies that I bought a lot from and who said that they read my stuff and they liked my stuff. And I would ask them if they could help offset some of the costs by sending me just some of the stuff, right? And like, maybe that was unprofessional. I don't know. It was like 2012. It was the wild west of internet art supply reviews. Um, and I kept butting my head against your numbers are not high enough for you to be worth us working with. So it kind of created this... Right. So um, now when they contact me and they want to send me something, I'm like, oh, they noticed me, which is like, that's, yeah. So like, I have to be like, mm, I can't do it as a yeah, review. I understand that. When I first got into the the whole online thing, I had been, um, so I used to teach in person. I had a studio downtown. And then when I got pregnant with the twins, I realized, because I had a uh, one-year-old at the time and I would bring him to work with me. And, uh, uh, one of the parents would sit with him while I taught the classes and I had a babysitter that would come and that was doable. But with the twins, I'm like, I can't, I would have art supplies under one arm, baby on my hip and going up the stairs. I'm like, I can't do this with two more babies. And so I closed the art studio, but I always felt like something was missing. Like I felt like I had to have some sort of identity outside of motherhood. And so I started sending my work into magazines. And since I had adorable little children and I've been doing a lot of scrapbooking, I started sending to scrapbook magazines and I tried to get on design teams. And I heard the same thing over and over. You have no, so you have no presence online. Yep. It doesn't matter, you know, and you couldn't even get them to open your emails. Yep. You didn't even know if they, they would see anything. And like, I told myself, you're going to submit your work every month for a year and if nothing comes of it then then just give up it's not meant to be it was only 11th month i got something to be in trends magazine but but that was the thing it's like you need a social media presence i was able to get into the decorative painter because they didn't really care because it was being sent 
in a magazine mm-hmm. out to their subscribers. But, um, and then when I started a blog and I started putting things in galleries, they wanted your galleries. They want to see how many people had, watched, had looked at your products. They want to see how many hits your blog had. And you just keep, I don't know, I guess I was judged by that for so long that when they started coming call, I was like, yeah, I know why you're here. You know, it's kind of like, <laughs> I know what you want. I know why you're here. I do not feel any sort of obligation to you. Um, I can review this completely unbiased because I think the, uh, the, uh, uh, the rose tinted glasses were gone and I knew what this transaction was. It was, they're hoping to get some, uh, some free publicity, hopefully some positive publicity. And yeah, I, I guess, I guess I was jaded pretty early on and so that's, I, don't think I think it, that's I a healthy cloud. response though. That's a more health because like seeing it as a business relationship, I think is mm-hmm. more of a healthy response. And the amount of companies, the amount of companies that want women to work for free, the amount of creative industries that expect women to work for free. I wanted to be on a design team so bad. It's like, why did I want to be in a position where I was going to have a lot of pressure on me and not get paid and just get a few, a few free products here and there. It's like, it's because I wanted the validation. Yep. I wanted, you know, I wanted to have some proof that my work was good. And they're not the ones that proves your work is good. You already have to have the good work. You already have to have the followers to be considered. So at that when that when that realization struck me, it was kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do my own thing because it doesn't. I don't need their their validation. But all of this to say is, I feel like I can review a product that's sent to me for free without going gaga over well, the company. See, the thing is. I actually did butt my head against that at NAMTA. I would have people ask me what my subs like. Okay, first of all, they wanted my Instagram. And like my Instagram does so poorly. It has done bo- poorly for years. Like I post to Instagram more as like a portfolio than like thinking I'm going to get like new people who enjoy my art or anything like that. But they cared the most about my Instagram. And then I huh. would usually offer my YouTube because I feel like I have other than teaching in person and and talking to people on discord, I feel like my YouTube is like generally the most indicative of my audience, the most indicative of my regulars. Like you can look at my comment section. Um, and they were less, way less interested in that, but then they wanted to know about my TikTok, which I do have a TikTok, but I don't like take it that seriously. So it was, I don't have it. Oh, go ahead. um, It was just kind of, Oh, like it was kind of weird because it was like, well, Nanta decided I was I was big enough and good enough to be here. And like, I would love for you to look at my art. Like if you go to my Instagram and I'm just a bad fit for you, that's fine. But you're literally talking about you want people with a manga style and you want people who are multi uh, multimedia and you want people who are familiar with teenagers and have teaching capabilities. You're going to look at my numbers on Instagram but you're not going to look at my tutorials. You're not going to look at my art style. You're not going to like contact my employers. So that's kind of where it like, and it was like multiple people we talked to that would come up. Like I hadn't even talked about collaborating with them. Wow. I think that is very insulting because when you look at the creators that have the most strong connection with their audience, it's the creators that have the smaller subscriber count. It's the, what they call micro influencers. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't, you know, and I'm not, that's not a derogatory no, no, term. I, yeah. it's just... I think I fall more into that category too, because I have a lot of regular commenters and they check out my mm-hmm. premieres and they hang out with me during live streams. And like, I know what their art looks like because they share it in my discord server. And you have the time. Yeah. And you have the time to respond and interact with them. And like the bigger you get, the larger channels, they it's don't have as do much that. time yeah. to respond to their audience because they're, you're one person. And then you've got hundred thousand people that are trying to have a conversation with you and you just can't. So the chances of somebody buying something because a smaller influencer reviewed it is much higher than them buying something like per percentage wise than somebody buying something because a big influencer, uh, recommended it because there's already a certain amount of a lack of uh, a lack of relationship and also a lack of trust with a bigger influencer than there is a smaller influencer. So I'm surprised that they were that dismissive where they're in an industry that is so niche that they, I would think they'd want to go after the niche creator I, I that is that might using be. their products. Yeah. I kind of think, and this was mostly just with the big companies and it was like three or four times it wasn't everybody but um 
I think they're looking at what's working or what historically worked in the world of craft and thinking that's what's going to work in the world of art. It's odd that they're going after Instagram because Instagram is notoriously hard to get people off of. So if you want people to shop, if you if you have if because like I I've done Instagram I've done sponsored Instagram posts for like Bic uh, you know Bic pens mm -hmm. and I'm like why do you want to do Instagram when I have YouTube with a much larger audience and it was it was a PR company and they're like they want Instagram they want Instagram it's like there's no you can't click from that they have to go to my profile page which they're not going to mm -hmm. do and then they've got to click onto my link tree and then they've got to find that post. It's like that you're asking people to go four steps just to get to your the page that you want to send them to. But on YouTube, if it's something they like, they're it, one click yeah, away in the description. from whatever whatever they need. But they're like, no, we just want we just want um, we want branding. We want we want to be in the minds of people. We don't care if it sells anything. We just want to get so on that note, But I also notoriously bad at Instagram too. I my Instagram is I've been on for quite a long time. I just I, I enjoy it. I enjoy scrolling yeah. through Instagram and seeing other people's art because I only follow artists. And I enjoy posting my stuff there as kind of a portfolio, like you said, and to keep myself accountable if I'm doing an art challenge. Yeah. But as far as like knowing what to do on Instagram or cracking the code, I don't have a freaking clue what to do over there. So I'm just like, well, I'm just going to use this as a hobby because I enjoy it. And YouTube is more of the, and my right. blog is more of the business. And obviously my school is the business platforms. On that note, I got an email from a PR person with Miss Vicky's. They are doing an art challenge but they were soliciting um they wanted me to do free art for their challenge with no no payment like your art could be on a billboard talking about like women and free labor and art and design and i sent back a little sassy email about like if you you're a billion dollar company you can pay your artists i don't know what miss vicky's is it's a chip okay so they're owned by frito-lay and they're a chip company oh what yep. And they wanted free. Nope. Oh my word! Not that's for like them. the contest. Have you seen the, it, that's the, exactly the contest? Yeah. Where please, oh yeah, those drive me crazy. Sometimes it's funny though to see like a company post that online and see the like the responses by different yeah. artists. That's a riot. Yeah, it's like I. And if you're such a big company, wouldn't it just be easier to hire an artist whose work you like and pay them versus like running this big contest where you have to have people sorting through everybody's artwork to pick one that you like i don't even I think, think they were going to do it like that i think they were going to have the audience vote so that's user generated content that's a big thing right now and then that's also engagement so that's more if if people were actually participating in this and voting that's engagement that's telling instagram like show frito-lay show miss vicky's to more people i think oh, it was kind of yeah. smart but it was also like really scummy yeah, it's just gaming the system. That's it. I feel like, yeah, because I'm very grateful for social media for the opportunities it's given me because YouTube has been, if you consider YouTube social media, it's given me a huge opportunity. But on the other hand, it has just opened the door for so much bad stuff that you wonder if it's worth it sometimes. So one thing you mentioned about uh, going, just kind of circling back to NAMP, yeah. people are probably like click on, clicking <laughs> Sorry, on the podcast. It wasn't like, clickbait, what are they I promise. Talk? I'm going to have to be careful what I titled this. Um, so you said that there were a lot of, or or there were some booths that did not allow photography yes. and videography. Yes. Do you think it might be because with all of like the Chinese knockoffs that they were worried that, and if their product's not coming out so, until like six, 12, 24 months, that they might get knocked off before they get to come out with their that's product? That's a good point. Individual booths could choose. So we had three signs, right? There are signs where like all photography is cool, don't care. We have signs that say, please, please ask. And then there were signs that said no photography whatsoever. And a lot of the Chinese vendors did have the no photography whatsoever. I actually saw that Art Secret was going to be there. And I went to go say hi because I bought their brushes on AliExpress and I like them. And they were surprised that I recognized them. And they gave me, they let me record and they gave me the tour of the whole booth because they manufacture their brushes. And while they white label, they are their own manufacturer. They're not necessarily interested in copying what other people are doing. But there were a lot of businesses there that were entirely business facing like not even art supply store business facing they were looking to work with like american crafts for example to white label their paints or to white label their manufacturing services so i could understand why you might not want 
that to be part of a YouTube video or a vlog post, because if you don't take the time to ask them and to understand what's going on, it could be painted in a really negative light. And a lot of them, their English was better than my ability to speak any language other than English, but a lot, there was still a language barrier. So like for me, Mm -hmm. I didn't ask to record in any booth where I felt like I was putting them on the spot. So I think for some of them, they just weren't super comfortable with English and didn't necessarily want to be recorded. Mm. I saw a palette on the video you did of the Art Secret booth, and it's a palette that I bought from um, uh, Zen Art Materials. And it was this palette. It was like 20, actually 26 watercolors. There were like two extras that folded out, and then there was like brushes that folded out the other way. That was fun. Those were very inky. They were, kind of reminded me of, um, there was a set of, um, it was it was a Koh-i-Noor, the Mikador line of watercolors that I don't think you can get them in the United States. Oh, uh, they're they, from they, Australia. They had like the white, there was like the stackable ones, right? And with the white, yeah. I wanted to try they're those. S- those seem neat. Oh, they're so, they were so, um, so inky and the colors just, uh, just like exploded on the paper that definitely dies. But it's kind of like what I thought ink tents would be like before I got the pan paints because they're just so like, they, they're probably not permanent. We paint. Yeah, they're not permanent. If you flick water on them, they'll react. But yeah, they were they were really cool. And that's what those uh the watercolors from that company were like quite a bit. And then I saw it because then they're not available. It's like yeah. one of those fly by night yeah. products that you get. You're all excited. You do a review about and it. And by the time you get your video out, well, yeah, <laughs> it's disappeared. It was just so frustrating. Yeah. Um. Ugh, I that's that's. A- I saw that there too, and I was no, like, oh, I wanted to review that. But what I was most interested. In there is they're releasing some nice ceramic palettes. And I think Jack Richson distributes theirs under their own name. Um, but they're just like solid, heavy ceramic multi-well palettes. I think you got me onto switching from my garbage plastic, easily stained palettes to ceramic palettes. Because once I quit flying all over the country for shows, I could actually use ceramic palettes. Oh, yeah. I love a ceramic palette. It's so nice. And I, I will like look at thrift stores and stuff and see if I can find like neat old egg dishes or just cool white. I have too many. I have too many, but they're just so, they're so exquisite to paint on. And I've got this big one that's, um, it's like a, a color wheel type palette it's uh it's like the Stephen Kohler one um and it's ceramic and I've been thinking that it's still empty because I want to use it for gouache but I don't really want to put out a bunch of gouache to let it dry but I like not having to clean my palette Mm -hmm. so once I've done all my mixing gouache series then I'm going to figure out what I want to put in that palette and I'm just going to put out what I need for a painting, but not wash it. So whatever's left in the well can just, I'll top it off the next time. So I won't end up wasting. I'll have a kind of like a, a little gouache ecosystem, if you will, going that I can keep dipping into and I mean, um, supposedly be ready to go that's, whenever I want to sit down. That's like the better way to do it. Cause you get like a mother where you, all your colors are like a little tinged and they feel more like organic together. I wash my palettes mm-hmm. out in between. Cause like I'm often shifting radically between what I'm doing and cat hair. I would wash out the mixing area, but like the, cause there's wells around the, the perimeter. So I would just kind of like put my fresh gouache in there, but if there's still gouache left over mm-hmm. that's dried, I'll just go on top of it so it can kind of reconstitute. But um, that's another thing I noticed when, when I first started and when I was teaching, I had like eight colors that I would have my students get. And I didn't, I didn't vary. I didn't go wandering out to see what other colors were available. I had you know, I, I was using like Prussian blue, ultramarine blue, uh, cad yellow, deep, um, nickel titanate yellow. And um, let's see, I used cad red and alizarin crimson. And I had a burnt sienna and yellow ochre and that was it. And that's, that's what I used. And so like, there was always this, and that's a pretty basic palette, pretty standard, like traditional palette, but your work would have a certain flavor to it. And I noticed now that I jump around to so many different palettes, there is less continuity and consistency in my work. And it's kind of, it's one of the, the bad things about what I do for a living. I think the bad social media influences that I'm always jumping from one thing to another thing. And I think a lot of people do. It's fun, but it's also really fun. But also, I feel like it does hold me back a bit from growth because instead of seeing what I can really do with one with one particular supply, yeah. I'm off to the next thing once I've got it reviewed. You know, 
No, no, I know what you mean. And I'm, the, I'm, I'm fighting the little demon on my shoulder to say something quippy about like, well, with AI art doesn't matter, or AI generated art doesn't matter anyway. <laughs> no, please ignore me. Um, I'm always fighting those, be those here, lesser but... demons. Now, um, I guess it depends on what makes you happy and what works for you, right? Like if, if jumping from palette to palette is scratching that itch and your audience likes it, then it's working for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes I'll think like this is my year of favorites. So I am really like I just saw I saw a palette today. And it's like, I know it's junk. But it's so cute. But I know it's junk. And I've resisted. But it's just like, you know, I get tempted by those. Uh, oh, and look at the folds out. And it's a child palette. Ooh, yeah. and then, you know, it's just like, no, close down the browser. Stop looking. Um, but so this is my year of favorites. So I'm using my favorite things. And if I buy something, I want it to be really good quality from a company that I want mm -hmm. to see stay in business versus like fly by night, Amazon alphabet soup companies yeah. that, you know, come up with a cute palette and then they, you never see them. By the time you have a chance to review it, the, the product is gone and you can no longer find it or recommend it, or you buy it, you love it. It's still there, but the company changes yes. its manufacturers yes. and what you bought that was awesome or even in nefariously, if they sent something to you because they're a new company and they're trying to get the word out and you review it and it's great. And then six months later, they, they degrade the quality, the quality yeah. on it. Yeah. Then, so it's, it's kind of like, uh, I don't, See, it's, it's hard to temper it. That's like I don't want to another feed into reason that. I will buy my stuff is, and I don't let them know I'm buying it ahead of time is I don't want them. I want to get what everybody else is getting. I want to get, if I tell my best friend to buy it, we should be getting the same quality. Um, and I worry that if they mm -hmm. knew an art supply reviewer was buying their stuff, they might like cherry pick the better one. So mm. that's part of my reason too. And it's caused some problems for me because sometimes people are like, well, I wish I'd known you were going to review it. And I'm like, but why, why, why did you wish? Why were you going to send me like the, the better yeah. one? I want, send me the same trash you're sending everybody else. Right. Right. Or if somebody knows you're going to review it, then you could have an angry mob at your doorstep if it's, it's the internet, not yeah. reviewed yeah <laughs> yeah but i would like to think we all yeah. appeal to our better angels and don't do things like that but it is also the internet mm -hmm. yeah yeah it is uh, something you mentioned on your vlog of namta you mentioned um some things being available already on the gray market yes. some of the new products can you explain what that okay, means so that's um and i i kind of was educated on this um so a bit Mostly I learned about this from Holbein and I was watching one of your recent artist chats and I was like, Oh, I wonder what happened there. Cause someone had a not as good experience. Um, so the problem with Holbein is people in other countries will get access to Holbein products first. Like Japan is usually like a first release country for them. So then they will like sub pack it, you know, in those like cute little clear, you, you know, they look like chiclets. They're adorable. You don't, you don't know what I'm talking about. Do you mean like the samples that yes. you can buy? Yes, and I've bought those too because like if I just want to see if a granulating paint is actually different than all the other granulating paints on the market, I don't want to spend $9 a tube just to see how it granulates, right? But like apparently people will subpack them. And the problem regarding Holbein is Japan has different safety standards than the U.S. does. So the U.S. is stricter which was surprising to me about things that cause cancer and making sure it's labeled on the package. So like if you have, I think it's like peach black can cause cancer. And I had some tubes that I bought when I went oh, to wow. Japan and some tubes that I refilled in the U S and lo and behold, the marking is actually on the U S one. So the problem with gray market sub packaging is this information, the pigment information, the cancer information, the ASTM information that's not available. So that puts Holbein as a company in a precarious situation because if it is I don't know what agency has to believe they're the ones releasing these products but basically if there was a lawsuit they might become embroiled in these sub packaged products does that make sense yeah, we were talking to Harry mm -hmm. yeah we were talking to Harry from the art gear guide and he did a review on Holbein and uh, pencils for color pencil magazine or one of the color pencil magazines and um, he was contacted by Holbein USA and 
threatened to be sued and stuff because this uh this product shouldn't have been sold it wasn't being sold in the United States yet and I don't know if this magazine was a United States based magazine or not but they were threatening to sue him and so he contacted Holbein Japan they're like don't worry about it everything's fine and uh so he never really knew what was going on and we found out from um another YouTuber she's actually a fellow Mainer um uh Shanna from caution artist at play mm -hmm. and she's a ambassador for Holbein and she said that it's because they didn't have like the the ASTM yeah. certification on their tin on the packaging yet so that's why that's what the holdup was they had to get that certification before it could be sold in the United States and uh but when you when you're ordering watercolors that have been like put in the little the little the half pans that poured out from larger things how do you know that you See, can that's trust why I don't the like, people you're buying that's why from? I don't like doing that and I think I only did it one time with the white knights super granulating and i can't find those so i may have to buy the real ones anyway and it was just because at the time i couldn't find the tubes even on aliexpress yeah i have found with white knights tubes i don't like them as much as the pans even when i squeeze mm -hmm. them into pans and dry them down i don't think the tubes are as good then, then maybe i should buy the half pans anyway even though i, I was gonna do I like a no, are... a no buy after this year I don't have, if I had them, I would send you some, oh shoot. Um, I don't have any of their, well, I do actually I do have some tubes, but they're not the super granulating. Uh, but I can send them to you if you want. No, I have, you, you I have some white of the half hands and I don't, I, I use the Yarko White Knights when I first started watercolor and I really like them, but I don't yeah. feel like the newer White Knights are better than the older ones, but they cost more. The half pan, I reviewed yeah, the half pan. Yarko was uh yeah, Yarka came over from because I bought a set of twenty four back at um, my brick and mortar set back in the late nineties, and that was a uh, let's see, that was Jack Rick Richardson. Jack Richardson yeah. used to yeah. bring the the Saint Petersburg over, and I know they've reformulated White Knights to be more light fast in recent years, but I didn't notice a huge difference between my Saint Petersburg. To me, and it was the, the price White point. Knights the ones. the increased price point made the performance less acceptable to me okay uh, uh, okay and white knights Look, was more expensive gonna, uh, yeah they are but i'm gonna caveat okay i have found that in general i don't care for more opaque watercolors that are more finely milled mm -hmm. like i like my granulation and i like my translucency so like i am probably always going to be biased against brands that are a little bit more opaque just the kind of stuff I paint like they're not bad paints they were just I was painting like mixing skin tones and it was turning to mud so it just wasn't a good fit for me yeah I think I'm a little bit um I don't know, bias might be the wrong word but I I don't like poured pans from manufacturers as much as I like extruded hmm. pans I find extruded pans are generally higher quality and last a lot longer than the than the poured pans in my opinion like an extruded pan will last me as much as a 5ml tube of watercolor, but a poured pan doesn't seem to have as much pain as a 5ml tube. They also of are like, I feel like they're a little drier and domed over. So you might be getting yeah. more out of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's no liquid, you know, you don't have the moisture right. in there. It's completely compressed. I've, uh, that's, that's what I have found anyway. And see, people so, get, have gotten both. I mean, I think the quality is. Oh, people have gotten offended in my comments because I will point out that a tube, a pan is extruded. And I literally, in general, with a professional quality brand, I don't like one over the other that much. I point it out because there are some people who do care and it is something to be aware of. But people will think I'm saying it's extruded like it's a bad thing. Now, when I say it's like a dry extruded little chiclet of paint when I'm reviewing cheap stuff on Amazon, yeah, that is not meant to be a compliment. But like Windsor and Newton's half pans, are extruded and that's what i used for years yeah i have i like that i have no problem with their half pans i feel like they're they're caught well i have no problem with their artist half pans in fact i'd love to get my hands actually i'd love to get my hands on a full pan of windsor newton potter's pink because i don't like i would i like my mary blue potter's pink that rewets fine but generally i find potter's pink to be very hard to reactivate and i wonder if, if it's I, like I, I think if it was formulated then you know, like Daniel Smith's Mayan Blue, once it sets up, it never, yeah, because yeah, it's a clay base. I wonder if Potter's Pink, it's the same kind of oh. thing. That makes sense, because Potter, Pottery right. Clay, maybe it is. Yeah, but it seems like if Windsor Newton formulates a pan, 
I'm not a huge Winsor and Newton fan by any stretch of the imagination, but it seems like when they formulate a pan, it's going to re Yeah, they, um, you know, their rep used regardless. to do hands-on creativity at Plaza, <laughs> and he said that their pans were specially formulated for re wettability Personally, like I did some head-to-head, -head I didn't test the whole color range, but I did do some head-to-head -head tests with like basic mixing colors, and I didn't necessarily notice any difference between half pan rewettability and from the tube dried in a half pan rewettability. But Potter's Pink might be one of those colors where it makes a big difference, or like maybe some of the nat, like like uh, Terra Vert, some of the weird natural mm -hmm. earth colors that are a little harder to re reactivate. Maybe that's where the half pan is where the money's at. Yeah, I would love to get a full pan of theirs, but I don't, I, I, none of like Blick doesn't sell it. Jerry's doesn't sell it. I didn't check Jackson's. Jackson's now has a, a uh, warehouse in Maine actually oh. for fulfilling American orders, but um, I, I think they might be limited, uh, limited stock there. So I, I would love to be able to go and tour it. That would be so awesome. <laughs> well, my friend who came is from, um, oh shoot. Delaware. I don't know why my brain like shorted on me. And a lot of the companies are located like in a two hour drive from y'all. Well, don't, don't, don't a lot of companies incorporate in Delaware for tax no. benefits? No, yes, yes, they do. But like when we talked to them, they were like, oh, we have a physical location in Pittsburgh. Like, or yeah. So like not too oh. bad. Oh, interesting. Well, it kind of makes sense, I guess. There's a because there's a lot of old, um, old companies mm -hmm. up here. And it seems like if if you're a company that's still in business, especially if you're dealing with um, with art supplies, and especially if you're selling art supplies, I'm not even talking about manufacturing, but like if you're a um, independent art retailer or an independent like a smaller art company, I think Kramer Pigments is in New York or something. They, yeah, they um, are. It seems like you have to be like an older company, and I think it's because it's so expensive to start a business now. But if you already own the building and you were there forever, it's like to keep it going is a little bit. Is a little bit easier. But also, manufacturing so makes art sense. supplies is just really expensive. The margins are, I mean, pigment costs are like really expensive. So I could, you know, and I'm really surprised that artist grade materials don't cost more than they do. Because if you look at like, <gasps> oh, but those what prices are pay, going up. I had a sticker shock at uh, Cheap Joe's. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, listen, listen I, just, I bought, okay. So they do a lot of white label stuff for their store brand, right? So they have these watercolor palettes. Mm -hmm. I promise you they were like mead and watercolor palettes, but they had like the Cheap Joe's on it screen. I paid $44 for that thinking I was also getting six pans of American Journey paint. No, it's just an empty palette. I felt so stupid. Oh, I would man, never I would do that. Back. Well, they're in North Carolina and I'm in Louisiana. So I just have to learn my lesson. Oh, I find that the metal empty tins sold at art suppliers are insane. Yeah, usually. You know, especially when we can see what, what they cost on Amazon. I actually bought, and this sold out, so I don't know what the deal, why it was so cheap. But I got a set of six of the 12 half pan tins that had 14 half pans in each of them. And the set of six was $12. Mm -hmm. So it was like $2 per half pan, I mean, per metal tin with 14 half pans in it. So it was crazy. what I do now, and I like this, is I buy the Amazon empty metal pencil cases and I buy packs of 100 half pans in the magnets and I just set them up like that mm -hmm. and washi tape on the front what that paint is in there. Oh, right. that works out well. And there's room for pencils. Like you can, they're pretty, they're pretty good size. So you could add more pans very easily. They're very modular. Oh, very cool. I save a lot of different tins. So I have kind of like a mishmash of, of a bunch of different things. I don't think I'll run out anytime soon, but if I do, I can check out the well, Amazon. I was thinking of that <laughs> because I've business. been flirting with the idea of doing watercolor art kits with like my line arts printed on like Canson XL or probably Canson XL if I'm being real. I can't get my toner printer to take it very well though. That's kind of the downside. So I may have to find another printer, but I wanted, that's why I've been reviewing like the Mei Liang and the Art Wheel is I wanted a really good student grade that I could affordably include without it making the kit cost 70 bucks because I know people are going to kind of balk right. at that. So that's kind of where I started looking at those tins was like, okay, how can I make this nice without spending all my money on pallets? Yeah, I wonder if you went to the library and brought the paper, trimmed it to their like eight and a half by 11 and see if you could photocopy your line art on it. 
because it where it's, it's kind of like the, it might be the the rollers. Oh, it has to it has to turn. Yeah. It, there's and no so like flat feet. I've through. tried this at Office Depot, and with a white cotton rag, not cotton rag, a white cellulose cold press paper, the machine can't see uh-huh. it. So you have to tell them to set it to ivory, and then it can pick it up. Uh huh. Yeah, I've never been able to get watercolor paper to go through my printers that I've had at home. Even I even got a uh, one that's like a back feed mm-hmm. now, so it doesn't have to curl. And it's still heavy cardstock, like the 110 pound, like the thick stuff that I would use for a card base or 140, even 90 pound watercolor paper. It just doesn't, it doesn't want to take so it. I have been running, flat running my watercolor paper through my printers for 10 years now. And you, you have to buy the expensive ones, like the expensive Canon ones that have a completely flat lay where it just runs through flat. And I'm currently using a flat lay oh. large format Epson. They're a big price investment, but the fact that I print my blue lines yeah. onto it and it's water soluble, that's how I just, like I do every comic page that way. Um, so is it, does it take the ink that you can refill like the tank that, yeah, or do you have to buy the cartridges Epson for it? does have the refillable ink. Because we, we got an Epson, but it's just an all-in-one. You have to put cartridges. And my goodness, I am putting a cartridge. I probably, I'm at least changing one ink every other week. And like around Christmas mm-hmm. time when I'm printing a lot of photos and making the scrapbook calendars for my mom, it's, I, I will go through an entire pack, sometimes two packs of the Have you considered switching and... to a toner printer? We bought, wow, well, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to sell you. This is like the zine part of no. me. Um, when I was teaching at Community Ed and I was printing a lot of zines, we bought a toner printer because if you're printing in bulk, it does color pretty well and it's much more economical. Oh. And it can. Does it look like photos? Uh, well, I've broken it. Uh, this is my third one. I tend to blow through the, the heater diffuser for some reason. Um, yeah. But when it was new, I would print my portfolios for SCBWI with it. And it was really pretty good. I would say I, mm. I'm not looking for like photo studio quality photos. So it depends on what you're looking for. Because if you have like a really nice inkjet printer, those can do art quality. Like people will sell them as Gickly prints or art prints, the ones that they do on their really nice Cansons. The toner printer isn't that good, but it's certainly good enough for doing like, um, I was doing my portfolio with it. Cause I like to, I like to get some, cause I'm not, I don't have my act together enough to like upload all my photos to Snapfish or wherever. I haven't even printed I haven't ordered photos in ages. I just print them off on my printer. I don't have my act together early enough to have my prints ordered and shipped back to me to scrapbook with because I'm like kind of figuring out on the fly how big I want the photos and stuff like that. So I do like to have a good quality photo printer at home and the Epson does really well, um, but it's just those darn cartridges. And it's like, I, I don't know how much is ink is in them. There's probably like a teaspoon of ink in the entire cartridge and then you've got that big piece of plastic that you've got to throw away afterwards i don't think staples used to take them take them i don't know if they do anymore but depot might still. it's just a frustrating yeah they might um so that's so that's all the gray market is is just Re- reselling um, stuff that shows up on so either you're buying selling on amazon from another country and you're reselling it in the u.s without like the proper licenses like there's a lot of companies that sell japanese stationery but most of them have the proper licenses to do it um I don't know that I would consider like if you had bought like like people will buy the barrel Prismacolors on eBay. I don't know if that really falls into the gray market because that's like a discontinued in a way product. Um, but yeah, it's it's or um, I know of people who will buy watercolor palettes and then sub pack it and then sell those. Like they'll buy like a set of tubes and then sell the sub pack tubes. So I guess that's what the gray market is. What about buying current Prisma colors from a third party seller on Amazon? Would that so be gray market of, or no? Because... Some of those third party sellers are gray market. I found with after talking to the whole buying guy. Well, I recently uh, bought the um, the core mini palettes, and I got a great deal on them on Amazon. But they were from they were from a third party seller. They were shipped and everything, and I got them in like three days. They were a great seller. And I was trying to figure out why they were so cheap because they're around twenty bucks Ooh, a that's pop. A very and they, good deal. The, yeah, and the regular price was like fifty four ninety nine on on Blick, and then their Blick price was like thirty five. But um, I was trying to figure out why they were so cheap, and I think it's because 
where core came is coming out with 20 new colors they i saw are, in your video yeah. and they're discontinuing are they discontinuing yeah and they're discontinuing eight yeah they're discontinuing eight hmm. and the granulator set had a color that was being discontinued and all the pa all the packaging all the like the pamphlets inside had the old colors in it so i figured maybe it was kind of like an arbitrage situation where they were oh, sure. like, just liquidating all of the old stuff with the old packaging so they could you know re re uh revamp it and re-up it and stuff because the paint seems legit it's great quality it's been wonderful to paint with i hadn't used their pans before their uh, extruded yeah, pans i really only nice. used their tubes but so i'm thinking there may be some more deals on core stuff coming up on amazon as the old stock gets flushed through maybe so golden has 20 new colors in the core line was there anything else new from golden with pan pastels oh. or with the acrylics <laughs> There is, there is, but I don't remember because I don't use them. And they were very generous in like talking oh, okay. to us about it, and and my brain was just smooth by that point. I'm I'm, I'm the oh, worst. I can imagine. I'm sorry. I got hyper focused on watercolor, so that's what I was like particularly looking for. Were there any other watercolor innovations that you want to share? So Windsor Newton is coming out with their, they're doing a revival set. And I'm really excited about that because they're reintroducing Tyrian Purple, which is one of my favorite colors. And I have had a hard time finding a really good, it's like a really warm purple and it's a good mixer for skin tones, um, like for doing the shadow. So I'm really excited about that. They had already run out of dot cards by the time we got there on the second day. So I didn't even... I don't even have a dot card to like check them out, but I'm really excited about like, I really like like vintage color palettes. Like um, I was a big fan of Holbein's Iridori line. I really love those kind of colors. So, and this is kind of similar to that where it's a lot of colors that have been discontinued and now they're bringing them back for a little while. Are they going to be available in a set, open stock, oh, or both? Oh my goodness. That's a very good question. I'm not, I'm not, oh my God, goodnessing you. I'm, oh my goodnessing my brain. Um, so we oh, did yeah. interview the coal arts people and he did talk about that. So the core one isn't available as a set of 20 because I would just buy that set of 20 new colors. Um, the revival colors are available as a set and they also have some like themed artists collaboration sets coming up as does core. Core has a themed like a portrait set coming out. Is it different than the Ali Kavanaugh set? I think that's the one. Yeah, I saw that one on Blick when I was looking because price checking to do my reviews on the core mini palettes. Those are good. That Urban Sketch one, I'm loving it because I mm -hmm. you know, love to go out and sketch whenever I get a chance. I'm trying to think. So, are there any other questions I want to ask you before I let you go today? Um, so you're planning on releasing more in-depth videos. Yep. You did your overall yeah. vlog of the NAMTA show. Can you let us know what you're up to with the individual recordings so that you did in the booth? We were able to interview several companies and they're very, I want to make this clear because I, I know some of my viewers see me as brutally honest and they expect a certain level from me. Uh, that was not, this was like a vacation for me. This was my, my birthday present to myself. So like every, <laughs> everything was real, like softball. Um, I didn't ask any particularly hard hitting questions because I just didn't feel well enough to do it. And I also like that wasn't why they're there. Um, so we talked to Fila about what they've got coming out. We talked to Cole Arts. We talked to Rocky Nook, which is an art book publisher. We talked to Schiffer Publishing, who is also an art book publisher. And that was more like, what what is the production when you're working with an artist look like? Because that's as I've been doing the easily influenced series, that's something I've been wondering about. It's like how many of them are actually paired with an editor? How familiar are these editors with the process that this person is doing? Um, we have an interview with Daylight that it turned into me just like fangirling over their lamps because I do really like their lamps, and it kind of turned into an interview. Um, we have an. Hannah Mule, Schiffer, Rocky Neck, Holbein. We have an hour long booth tour with Hol with Holbein that I still have to oh, wow. edit because it's like an hour <laughs> long. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna chuck that one into chapters because they have a lot of stuff that I I didn't realize they had so many acrylics products. And then they also carry Maxon, which is like a manga supply brand, but I guess we just don't see any of that over here yet. 
Um, who else did we talk to? Sorry. <laughs> I should know. There are lots and lots and lots. Yeah, it is lots and lots and lots. And I'm like slowly plugging away at editing them. Because, so, you know, you know, when you edit a lot, like you get tired of hearing your own voice. Okay, well, I'm, I'm hitting that point with the NAMTA stuff. I'm trying to keep my energy levels up. Um, I'm also going to do a standalone video where I talk about what's coming out and what I'm excited about for this year and next year. And oh, that would other be great. than that, I'm kind of open to suggestions, what people want to see from it. Um, I don't have as much footage as some folks do because of the photography policy. I just didn't feel comfortable. Like I did do have some walking around, uh, images, but I really tried to be respectful, not to get like people in the shot who don't want to be in the shot and that kind of thing. And something I did notice while at NAMTA is there was a lot of people who were very not comfortable with being reported. Like just from my own experience, like there were people who did tell us when we asked if we could interview them, like, no, we really are not feeling up to it today, which we respected. Um, there are a lot of people who were like, if you're going to record, I'm going to get out of the shot. So um, I didn't get as much footage as I thought I might have just because I wanted to be respectful of the other people who were in the hall. In fact, my friend who came with me was like, I'll be your camera person, but I do not want to be on camera. What's your um, release schedule looking like for these videos? So I don't want to tire everybody out with it, but what I'm going to do is I have like a normal video coming out on Sundays and then I'm going to go back to releasing NAMTA stuff on Wednesdays. And I'm just going to do that through the duration of the interviews and the like what's coming out next. Oh, excellent. Do you know what the first video is going to be? Um, yes, it is the Fila interview. So Princeton, Mimery Blue, uh, Strathmore, Canson. Excellent. That'll be good to see. I'll look forward to it next Wednesday. Yeah. yeah. Oh, are you going to continue to? Oh, uh, I'm yeah, sorry. Go ahead. My, my brain grabbed something. So, um, I don't know how curious you are about Arteza's advent calendars. I reviewed them for two years in a row and yeah. they were basically the same thing every year. So I got kind of burnt out. So I, the one time I was kind of aggro, the uh, Arteza guy that we were chatting with, he's like, ask me any questions. And I'm like, even kind of pointed question. He's like, oh yeah, go for it. And I didn't record this. So uh, I asked about the advent calendars. I was like, it looks like you guys are working with influential artists. Why don't you work more closely with them, let them pick the supplies, let them create projects for the calendars. Like that's something my audience is very interested in seeing. And that is the direction they are going in next for this year. So I guess I'll be taking a look at the Arteza advent calendars again. Oh, that's great. I've never bought one of the art advent calendars, but I've always kind of wanted to, but they never seemed like they were, uh, they were, they always seemed a little disappointing when I would see other people open up the advent calendars. Um, probably the best advent calendar I've seen was that one Miranda Watson yeah. did. Yeah, um, hers was really good. Yeah, that looked really, really nice. And I don't know how I can't. She like poured yeah, all those. Yeah, and they pans. were like, oh, uh, she's a fellow YouTuber. Sorry. Yeah, if you're if you're um, not familiar with who we're talking about, she is a fellow YouTuber. Her channel is um, Alaki Creek Art. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. She's a sweetheart. Uh, she did these mm -hmm. advent calendars where she. Uh, I think she had, did she have line art or, or watercolor paper? It was watercolor paper. You got one. Can you, can yeah, you get one? Yeah, I got one. one. Um, she had daily projects. What was in there? Okay, so there was water pro watercolor paper for every day. I think every day you got a full pan of either Da Vinci or Core that she self-filled. So you know what that means. You fill it, you let it dry and evaporate, you refill. I right, can't imagine. Right, and they were all hand-wrapped. Can't even. They looked like candy. Uh, they were beautiful. Um there was at least one project every day, often two projects, because there was like the calendar illustration that you were doing. And then there was like bookmarks or cards. Um, there was a tutorial video for every day, at least one. Some days had multiple. And there was also written instructions for it. It was a lot of work. And now my audience thinks I need to do an event calendar. And I'm like, just buy hers. I can't imagine. Yeah, I saw that and I'm like, wow, that is so much work. Uh, I, yeah, I'm like that something like that, I think would be a treasure would be a, like a treat to open every day. But a lot of them that I see the commercial ones are just kind of like, the package is pretty, but it just every I feel like if uh, like, I don't know, Lick I did it was, it as a company, like if they partnered and they did it or art snacks or like any of these companies that already have these brand relationships and they have these artist relationships, if they started a year ahead of time, they could do a really good one. 
I think it's kind of like the subscription box deal where it'd have to be a manufacturer mm-hmm. doing it because when you add the middlemen in, then this the costs get so high and the value can't be provided. Like when you see there's I don't know if subscription boxes are still a trend in the art world. Um, but for a while it seems like we were seeing tons of yeah. subscription boxes from art companies and craft companies. And it seems like the subscription boxes that are still around that really provided mm-hmm. the value were ones that were created by the company that was providing the products in there. So they didn't have the middleman. They kind of could bring it down at a at a more reasonable price and give you a lot. So you were getting more than your value that you paid for it. Like I'm thinking Tonic Studios had oh, one that was huh. really good. They're a die cutting yeah. uh, company. They do like a die cuts and scissors and things. They had really a really good one. I don't know if they still do it. Some of the stamp companies did because they're making the stamps, they're making the dies. So it was, it wasn't more than what you would pay in the store. And that makes sense too, for but like, if you have seasonal of... releases and somebody wants to get the whole mm-hmm. release because they, they are excited about this design set. Yeah. 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 So it's, um, I've been approached to do subscription boxes before and it's just it to make the numbers work out where I would feel right saying buy this box yeah. because it's got, you're, you're getting your value that you're paying, you're getting your money's worth. And I generally can't say you're getting your money's worth in these different subscription box schemes because the one I actually did one with paper craft society once and it was, it was a heck of a box. There was so much good stuff in there. It took me so long to design the papers and to do the all of this stuff. I'm like, never again. I spent so much time, and uh, I mean, I, was, I I knew what I was going to be paid because it was like a, it was a flat fee. So it's like I, I only have myself to blame. I didn't have to put the amount of time I put in there, but um, that was like it was like I think the the box was like thirty five dollars, but you got like a full sheet of dyes, full sheet of stamps, all these embellishments, pattern papers, and I had painted templates i had print templates on the boxes to make other stuff because it'd be you know because we already had the dyes thing but i wanted to have some other little things and um that was definitely your money's worth but uh other than that i mean it's it's just so hard to make the numbers work right for those subscription i used boxes to review subscription stuff. boxes and yeah I mean, I was harsh about it because I was assuming they were having wholesale yeah. prices and that they had these these part like art snacks, sketchbox, scrawler box, like they had these relationships in place. But yeah, consistently, there would be months where it just wasn't like from a consumer, it wouldn't be worth the money, in my opinion, to buy those boxes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, and also it's, it's probably works out if it's like a box that has a instruction guide and you're, and you're a newbie and you don't have a lot of supplies already and you're using it as a way to explore. And maybe it's kind of like, well, my husband and I started using that, uh, factor, the meal delivery Mm -hmm. kit, because I hate to cook and I'm vegan and he's, um, a meat eater and he can't have much carbs. Um, so it would just, it just made yeah. sense. You know, it's not cheap, but, but when it's just the two of us, I mean, we spend so much on groceries when we go to the grocery store that it really wasn't that different to just do the, the factor. Um, so knowing that, knowing that we're paying a premium for this and, you know, we're gonna, we don't have to choose or think about what's for, what's for dinner. It's just, we pick from a list and then it shows up on our doorstep and you get what you get and you don't get upset. And, you know, it's, pretty decent it's healthy you know we know what we're getting but are we getting our money's worth eh, no if i wanted to go and do some batch cooking then you know but you it would be way cheaper cook. but i feel like i'm see i love to eat and i right. don't like to cook so i'm like the fact that if it tastes good the fact that somebody else did it for me already kind of mm-hmm. Right. So you're buying your back time. It's worth it to us. It's worth it to us to do it for a month. We're also trying to, you know, drop mm-hmm. a few pounds before we go to uh, to France and the, the calories are all, it's all, it's all like healthy choices. You can choose like what kind of meals you want anyway. So it's worth it to us. But if it was like a family of five that was trying to like, I mean, it would be outrageous. It would just no, not and be I get worth what it. You and mean. plus like nuking every two, single. Because like I yeah. cook, we so, cook for two. My husband and I both can cook and shopping for two is a, there it results in a lot of food waste because everything is packaged for four to six. And while we do cook leftovers, Mm -hmm. there's still a good amount of food waste. So it can be hard to shop for just two people without it spoiling. Right. Right. And then, and also if I look at to that same effect, if we kind of transfer that analogy over to art supplies, um, 
I know I spend way more money on art supplies than somebody that's getting a subscription box or two. So if somebody just like having a little present delivered to them every month and they get to open up and try whatever's in there and have fun and not think about the project, not have to pick the supplies or pick the project, they're just going to get what they get and try it out and have a good time. I think subscription boxes are totally worth it for that. But if you've been, you know, painting, you've been crafting, you've been making art, chances are the stuff in the box is going to be stuff you already have, maybe not even as good as the stuff you already have. and if you're very particular, I, I don't think it's a good my, fit. My so friends, it's, just, it's one of those things where it's like subscription boxes. Cause I have several friends who still do like art snacks and that's exactly, you hit the nail on the head. Yeah. It is exactly why they do it. They have a full-time job in another sector. And when they want to make art, they don't want to have to like think, think, and it helps to have the supplies already picked out for them. The colors already picked out for them, a prompt already. Like it takes some of that pressure off for them and it makes it more accessible. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I definitely can see there's a market for it, um, but I'm de definitely not the market for it. <laughs> but I would just see a really good advent calendar because I just, I think that would be so fun just to open up a little door and have a little treat yeah. every day. But then circling back to consumerism, why do I feel like I need a little treat okay. every day? You know but what I mean? It's, to it's, be fair, uh, a lot of my viewers, probably a lot of your viewers are parents. And what they're interested in the advent calendar for is they want to introduce their kids to art. They want to do Mm -hmm. one activity every day with their kid they don't yet have a lot of art supplies and this if done well could be a wonderful memory and all this art that they've made together that they can save or they can put on the fridge or they can put in a scrapbook so like oh this, this is what makes it so hard for me because i can both sides the consumerist argument no problem like, do we need more art supplies? Probably not. But like my friend in Colorado who has like a 10 year old kiddo, probably yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. I, I definitely feel the cognitive dissonance of what I do. It's like, you know, on one hand, I love reviewing. It's, it's fun. I enjoy it. But on the other hand, I know that I am also feeding yeah. the want monster of other people that you know they see that and they want to try it too because i know because if i see somebody using something cool i have been like there's been a product since julie faye fan balls or recommend like recommended it to me i have been wanting to order not one or two sheets i've been wanting to order the pack of 480 sheets of carnival wet strength t tissue paper which is this, oh, like really strong yeah, yeah, tissue yeah, paper you tissue and with it right is it, it it's it's oh. white you can gel print on oh. it it's you can almost like sew with it they use it in like parade so, floats and so chinese lanterns the Japanese and paper plates had an interesting product that you might be it's like a kozu so it's like a seaweed paste that you apply to almost any kind of paper to make it a lot stronger this could be your oh. way to do that but with any paper you like oh maybe i could use up the all the the 5,000 sheets of deli exactly, paper I had because yeah. I ordered deli paper from Sam's Club. <laughs> Believe it or not, and like, I, oh, and then I, would... I also bought deli paper and I don't even do what y'all do. I, I saw y'all like the, because when YouTube was younger, the art space was a lot more like card makers, scrapbookers. And like, I was like, I'll give it a try. Why not? It's just deli paper. Do you have a jelly pl uh, gel plate or a jelly no, plate? No, um, I'm not into mono printing like at all. I'm into like mul like I went into comics. Like I'm into multiples. So like I like lino yeah. linoleum. I like woodblock. I like eraser carving. So it could still be used. Mm -hmm. Actually, it might be really cool with erasers. Yeah. Yeah, or even just like painted paper and stuff to collage with because it's so mm -hmm. thin that uh, that you can collage with it. But yeah, Julie was talking about that wet strength t tissue paper and the fact that it's it's much more sheer. If you glue down a layer, it's, it becomes invisible. So not just a little translucent, but it actually kind of disappears. And um, yeah, it's like $90 <laughs> for this big pack. It has to come over from the UK. And it's like these humongous sheets and it weighs a ton. It's like, I have no place to put it. It's not a legitimate purchase whatsoever but every once in a while i check it out and see if the price has gone down on amazon you need to find somebody you to, order to go from in their with global you store. Locally. like somebody who'll yeah. take half actually of it. joggles would yeah joggle sells like pat like a, sh a pack of like 15 i think they might be quarter sheets but but then i said wait but it's so much more money per sheet if i buy it that way if but i if buy the don't the big like pack it, then it's that big pack is all that wasted yeah. money yeah, if I don't like it, but sometimes I get a little stingy with using supplies. If I know I have a, only a limited amount of that. them, it's I don't know what it is. It's, I, 
I think maybe it's because I used to teach and I used to buy stuff in bulk and I'm, I get kind of like afraid of like using it up if I only have like one or two and I'm like, I'm afraid I'm going to love it and then I won't have any more. I don't know what it is. It's not like I, the store still has it. I can still buy more, but I have this like, uh, I don't know, maybe it's a scarcity mindset yeah. or something with art I mean, supplies, for, but I have enough. It's like, I need to get I get over that. it. And for me, it was, I live in rural Louisiana and if I wanted something specialty, I had to order it and wait forever. And then I might not be able to get it again. Mm -hmm. So I could relate. Maybe we could like yeah, talk same, each same other down on some of these things. Yeah, you, we can be accountability partners. <laughs> yeah, we talk each other into stuff. Or, or just split stuff, honestly. Yeah, yeah. I wish, I wish shipping wasn't so expensive because I have so many things that like, hey, you want to try this? Send it back when you're done. Yeah. It's like, but by the time it's sent over and sent back, it'd be just as cheap that just to would, buy that it. That would be you know? my preference. When I lived in Savannah, I had a bunch of friends who were going through art school with me and we traded art supplies all the time. So I got to try a bunch of stuff. And when I lived in Nashville, I had a friend who would loan me stuff that she bought or had gotten for presents to just so she knew I did reviews just so that I could review it. And it was, I felt so much better about it. It scratched that itch. And I wasn't mm -hmm. like just acquiring. Yeah. Yeah. That might be something that we can do. Maybe like flat rate shipping boxes or something like that. We should probably talk about this. Yeah. 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 Sorry guys. Everyone's like, why do we care about I don't this? Know. I don't know. My, my viewers are going to be like, can I get on that list, Becca? Because we've taught, we've have some like this, this traveling, the sisterhood of the traveling art supplies going around the country. We, we have actually discussed the logistics of doing that at one point, but I have a lot of friends from Canada and I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I can't, I'm not doing, I'm not shipping to Canada. Oh, it is crazy. I have all these, I had all these empty DVD cases that like, um, there was this, there's this company called Stampin' mm -hmm. Up and they sell their rubber stamps in these DVD cases, which is great because you can get pretty cheap DVD storage, but that still takes up more space than what I do. I take binders like, um, cause I still enjoy rubber stamps and I have quite a collection that I just, I enjoy owning that collection and then I enjoy using it. I don't use them as much as I probably should, but I, I like that I have them. And they, I store them in like three ring binders that you would get at like an office supply store and I store them by theme. That's so cute. if I know I want, and this is how, how, this is how insane my collection is. I have a collection of vintage storybook characters and I've got a collection of vintage sewing supplies and vintage art supplies and vintage, you know, I, Victorian people. Like my collection is, it's pretty crazy, but I store them in binders so that when I know I need that particular theme I'll take it off the shelf and I can flip through it like a catalog so I don't have to keep a separate catalog because if I had to look through a catalog and find the image and then go find the binder that's stored and just my it would yeah. fall apart and so I took everything out of the the divider the uh, DVD cases and somebody wanted some so I'm like oh sure you can have mine I'll send them to you but she lived in Canada and it was going to cost over a hundred dollars to send them and it's like this is not worth a hundred dollars and I just I was like I can't I uh it was just just crazy just go hit up goodwill i don't know why i don't yeah. know either i kept them i'm just like well what's oh, that i said i don't know either because like with books for example when people buy books from my shop i can do media mail but that's not available in canada <laughs> yeah yeah and i understand i mean we're asking them to take something from you know maine instead take it to louisiana or take it to california i understand that but man it just it's it's uh seems crazy and the fact that i think we're also so used to free shipping that and that's kind of to the detriment of the small independent stores is we are so used to free shipping that if a independent store can't offer it then it's like well we'll just go check out amazon or we'll get an order up to you know 59 dollars to buy it from mm -hmm. blake or jerry's or cheap joe's but back in the day back in the 90s when i was first ordering from like catalogs for my studio you had to have like a 200 dollars order for free shipping there wasn't it was like flat rate like you had to order a hundred dollars worth to get ten dollars shipping, so I'm we've gotten so like, spoiled. And then like flashbacks from '04 when my dad got me the anniversary set of Prismacolors because it still wasn't free oh, shipping. Is that the one in the big it's tin? The one in the big wooden box. Oh, wooden box. See, I have one from the late '90s. It was an anniversary set of 144, and it was in a metal tin about this thick, and the tin was probably 16 by 12. Um, and we still have the tin. We keep like, you know, mailing postage supplies and stuff in the tin, but, uh, yeah, back in, back in the day. <laughs> so hopefully they were good Prisma colors and not snappy The ones, ones I had were, it was before Newell had bought yeah. the company. Um, there is one company Sanford. I do want to like yeah. mention specifically. Um, if you guys like, and they don't, this is not this kind of relationship. I just really like their paints. I went to 
one of the workshops. It was the Stone Ground Workshop. And I was really blown away with mm-hmm. the quality of their paints. And I really, really mm-hmm. like them. They're really, really smooth and buttery. And I do, because they're a smaller company, and we were talking about Canada. Um, they're a smaller company and they're family run. I did want to like kind of mention, like, if you are on the market for watercolors and you don't mind spending more for them, they make some really nice watercolors. Oh, that's good to know. Do they do, I have a set of their metallics, but I, there's only certain uses I use the metallics from their gift. Um, do, are they, they do like a panned gouache, they don't do, they? They do, yeah. They recently released their, the gouache. Have you tried have that? Not, you know, I should have bought some and I didn't, but no, um, I bought some of some, op- they were doing open stock on the very last day, I think, instead of having to fly it. And then they also had like oh, nice. a scant handful of, ooh, ooh, this was a floor display that I bought. So it's not packaged necessarily the way. Oh, that's nice. And they, they were super nice. And like, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's very easy to, to win me over. Yeah, because I think it would be interesting to try their pan gouache since mm-hmm. they're formulated for mm-hmm. pans. That that might be interesting. I've all, Another Canadian company that I've never tried, but I'm curious about would be Beam, Beam Paints. Is, Have yeah, you tried them? Yeah, Beam is nice. Um, I don't think I gave them as fair a shot, though, because I wasn't doing as many florals then. I need to, like, dig up my set and try painting some florals with it because that's another one that's, like, a creamier kind of watercolor consistency. Did you get the ones that were in the wrapped in the wax or in the cookie? No, the, the, no, the ones wrapped in thing. the little wax wraps. That I don't... Yeah, how do you like that format? I thought it was really cool, actually. And it and I think I bought, like, the set where... It might have been, like, the mixing colors, where it comes with a wax wrap that you can wrap around it as well. Like, we were talking a little bit about sustainability. Seeing more companies use that kind of stuff, like fabric and wax, as part of their packaging would be a really cool direction to go in. And you asked me earlier about trends and I totally blanked out on you. It does seem like everybody's offering gouache this year or um, promoting their gouache this year. Oh, that's interesting. It does feel like gouache is having a moment. I've, uh, I've noticed that. And I found myself wanting to use it more myself. And I don't know if it's because you see other people do it. And so that you, you're reminded that you have it and you want to use it more, or maybe it was like the whole Mia Himmy that's what jelly I was gouache wondering. aesthetic art yeah, supply. If that maybe inspired people to like give that media a try and now they're ready for something that's going to be a little more archival, maybe. Yeah, it could be. I remember first trying gouache Back in the uh, well, back in the late nineties, I ordered. I bought a set of Reeves at. Um, oh gosh, maybe no. I think it was in the nineties. I bought a set of Reeves at Penobscot Paint, which is our local brick and mortar. Before they closed, and I thought it was pretty cool. But I, but it was also student grade, and it was it was all right. But I didn't fall in love with it because I don't think I had much. Um, I hadn't seen much artwork in gouache that I love, but now we have artists. Well, James mm-hmm. Gurney has been play, painting in gouache forever, but now we have access to yeah. seeing his work and knowing what it's actually gouache made painters. With. Yeah, yeah. Because when and I was a girl um, and I read Dinotopia, I assumed he was doing oils and acrylics because I I didn't know better. Wait, did no? Did he do? Because I know he did a lot of his book covers in oils. Did he do Dinotopia in in gouache? I don't know. I just assumed it was oils. Yeah, I bet that was I bet that was oils. Uh, well, actually, takes so I much know. layering. I, should, I didn't, you know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know, but I just love it. It's just so. I think I love it because um, it's ready to go so quick, and there's so minimal cleanup, and it's just it's so close to watercolor, but you get this whole other world of uh, of look to it. So I'm glad that's making a comeback. That'll be great because I've got a lot of wash content yeah. coming up. So yeah. <laughs> So, so if the people are, if people are getting uh, inked out by the halls, they can watch the gouache tutorials and that I feel much better about doing tutorials than, than haul videos. Honestly, that tutorials is my preference and that's where my heart is, but I kind of pivoted away from it because the lower view counts were just so discouraging for the amount of time. Um, I'm going to start working on back in though, cause I don't make money doing YouTube anyway, so I might as well do what I like. I think doing what you like is the key to success because if the, your passion will shine through and then viewers will find you'll, the audience will find you, you know, that likes those tutorials and you don't want to play to the audience. You want to, you want the audience to come that wants your stuff. So I think that 
um, that I prefer, I paint better when I'm not trying to talk at the same time. So whether I'm painting on the couch or out on the deck or I'm painting and the camera's rolling and I'm not trying to narrate mm-hmm. it, I think I'm a, I am be, I paint better that way. But I don't know if people like it as much than having a live narrative yeah. tutorial because watching live footage back is, watching my own live footage back is painful. I'm just like, it, it's fun to do. It's not fun to watch back, you know, like as far as like a content creator, it's like, I just want time lapse it and get through it, you know? So if it is going to be a real time video, I'd rather just narrate it while I'm doing it because I hate editing and I hate doing it after the fact. I'm such a, my editing is just so minimal on my channel because I try to just do it so I don't have to edit it, like get rid of any problematic things while I'm doing it. If it's going to be paint drying, just, you know, <laughs> stop the camera just so I'm just you know, putting stuff together in a timeline and I don't have to, uh, you know, do too much stuff. And I never got into the fancy editing that a lot of creators do, but yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if time lapses, I, it seems like live narrated, but short, that's right. like the hard balance. Like, like it's gotta like be for some of live, us, that's just not going to so happen. Not time lapse. Like you, we just don't yeah, do it's that. It's gotta look great. Yeah. I know. It's like you can pick two. You can have it a stunning piece of artwork. You can have it time lapsed, or you can have it. What is it? You can have it. You can have a stunning piece of art, or you can have it fast, or you can have it live. But you can't have. You can have two of those things. You can't have all three. You know? No. Wait. No, I, I, I get what you're saying, and <laughs> I don't know. What I I think yeah. it probably ties into people assume that because something is done fast, that makes it more accessible, that they're going to pick it up like that, and. Honestly, the way I paint is a very, it's a very forgiving way of painting when you're doing really thin layers and thin glazes. Like you can make, I make mistakes all the time and it's super easy to fix. It is so much easier. I'm trying to learn what looser watercolor florals, like more immediate florals. And that's hard. That's like, it's, uh, we, I think last time I hung out with you, we did the, I told, related the story of the emperor and the artist with the rooster. Refresh okay. my memory. I wasn't sure if the camera froze or if you were just like, what? Oh, um, okay. So an emperor wants to commission a painting of an artist or of a rooster. So he goes to his favorite artist and he's like, I want you to paint me a rooster. And the artist takes the commission and it takes him 10 years of study. And the story varies, but this is my version. And whenever the, the emperor sends someone to check on the artist, he's like, no, I'm still working on it. I'm still studying. And finally, the artist is like, okay, I'm ready to do it. So he goes to the palace and in five minutes, he paints a beautiful rooster. And the emperor is like, if you were going to paint it that fast, why did you spend 10 years? And the artist is like, well, it took me 10 years of constantly practicing to be able to paint it in five minutes. And that, I think that is how I feel about like any beautiful art that looks effortless and takes no time is it took that artist so long to be able to do those, to do that in a way, like I used to be an anime con artist where I would like draw commissions of people at the show. It was like, I was a trick pony. I learned how to do that specific thing really, really well. And it made it look like very easy and very aspirational, but it took a lot to learn how to do that trick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you ever get um, people on YouTube offer to buy your original artwork, but um, because they, they expect it to be really cheap because they see how long the video is and they think, oh, well, you painted that in like um, half an hour or so. <laughs> I have gotten inquiries and they were interested in paying a fair price. Um, and quite frankly, if I hadn't already sold that piece, I would have sold it to them. Um, but I don't get that many inquiries. And I know we kind of talked about like, I need to make it clear at the end of like when I do a video, like you guys can buy this, but that would require me knowing how much I want to price it for. And I often need time away from the piece to like think about what I would want to charge for it. Well, you wouldn't necessarily have to give the price on, um, on the video. Cause you probably takes a while for you to film the video and then get it edited, edited and uploaded. So you could finish the video and just say, if you're interested, this is in my shop link in the description. And then by the time the video comes out, you would have already had it posted and had a price decided. And that way you don't have to, go on the record and say a price yeah, on the video in case to to it. you realize that 
Right. In case, yeah, in case something you change your mind, like, oh, this isn't selling, I'm going to price it lower or, oh, whoa, that's so the last one sold so fast. This one really should, I priced it way too low. I should price it a little bit higher. I think most artists tend to price their work low. I know yeah. I do because I look at other artists' shops and I'm like, wow, they're, they're charging way more than, than I charge. And, but then like, if somebody balks at your price, you're like, oh my word, <laughs> I'm already charging. So, you know, so much less than so, con- like my contemporaries. You know how we talked about, I live in a poor part of the country. So I don't even bring originals to shows right now because um, everybody's so broke. And when you bring originals, first off, down here, it, from what I have seen, I, I don't I haven't lived every experience, but acrylics sell a lot better than watercolors. Like a big acrylic is more likely to sell. Um, you can just see it further away at the show. But also a lot of our shows are outside and I just don't want to bring bagged watercolors out into the humidity where they can right where they can get ruined for for like there to be no interest in buying the original so i've just stopped bringing originals to shows anymore i bring art prints and you know when people have money my art prints sell really well and then when people are having a hard time making ends meet they don't and that that is just the reality of it Mm -hmm. so i think i i price my stuff lower uh one because of the art style that i work in People tend to not high value that for the most part, uh, too, because I grew up in a poorer part of the country. So like our standard of living is lower and um, what people see as a fair price for things is much, much, much lower. And having people say that about your work for years kind of gets into your head. But also in the end, I if somebody is willing to pay like 200 bucks for one of my originals, that makes me happy because I know it's going to go up in their home and they're going to enjoy it. And that means a lot to me, knowing that my, like something that I made for them is going to be valued to them. Yeah, absolutely. So like I'm the, I never. Yeah, especially if you're selling to a local. Yeah, I never talk about what? pricing your art online because it is a really divisive topic. And um, I think when people do videos about it and it's like not nuanced it, it, i think you can get a lot of traction but i think it's kind of ill-advised to do that i feel like pricing your work is i feel like there's no good answer there's no good yeah. way you know it just feels like there's no good way so i you know honestly i think that's kind of influenced my work to my um my trend to work in sketchbooks more than anything now, because then if somebody asks me it's for sale and I'm like, Nope, sorry, it's in my personal sketchbook. And that's end of end of discussion because I have regretted selling some things because I've sold them for less than what they were worth in my, I mean, I mean, it's subjective, but I kind of regret it. Cause like, Oh, I could have licensed that. I could have like made note cards with it. I could have done these different things with it, but now I can't because it's gone and I don't have a high quality scan or maybe I scanned it, but mm-hmm. who the heck knows where I saved it because I am a mess when it comes to digital organization, except for my video backups. I'm good about video and class backups. But other than that, it's just, you know, I have, I would, I have to go hunt down the, the painting and retake a photograph of it when I need a new, when I need a high quality photograph or scan of it. Cause um, I just don't have that. I I don't know. I definitely prioritize the things that I want to do in the day. And like archiving my own work is like so at the bottom of that list that it just doesn't See, get done. If go to Instagram. You want to archive my work? It's the, on Instagram. The comics <laughs> background is actually, I'm like, it's benefiting me here because like I work for reproduction. So scanning it and getting a high quality scan is basically the first thing I do after it's dried. So I have, and my husband is, uh, he's a, software developer so he's actually really great at file organization and he i say bullies he does it with love and he's not actually mean about it but he's persistent about like making me organize my files making sure i have backups of things making sure because he will help me um get stuff onto products and stuff like that so making sure he also has access to the art stuff like that so like um i am very fortunate in that i have somebody who can help me out with that but like uh the the good copies is never a problem for me. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, that's, I don't, I don't relish doing work on the computer and uh, yeah, I like to do the fun stuff. I like to do the creative stuff, but like the editing, the archiving, that stuff is, I like to do the things that I'm going to get instant gratification from. I like to post it on Instagram where I might get a comment or a like or post it on YouTube, you know, so I get that feedback. That's awful. I'm just no, a child. No, basically. But, yet, but yet you keep your receipts. 
for tax time and I'm the one combing back yes. through Amazon to add it to Wave App. <laughs> No, I know exactly what you mean yes, about if that's it's not true. like push button, get <laughs> dopamine. I shouldn't, I shouldn't sell myself short like that. I feel like I'm that person of push button, get dopamine, but like clearly we couldn't do YouTube if we didn't have the ability to do like yeah. sustained boring tasks that have often low reward. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There is definitely a stamina that's required for this line of work. Even And being an artist is in fact, um, I have a lot of parents who, I don't know why parents do this. I, I, I'm not belittling them, but I don't understand this mindset. They'll come to me and they'll be like, my kid is in your class, but they'll never be, they'll never be an artist. They'll never be worth anything. And I'm like, why? Well, they're eight. Why are you deciding this now? Yeah. Wow. Like, like, don't worry about that. Like I didn't get serious. I got serious at 13 and that's super young. You know, like I know people who got serious in their forties and much later than that, like don't just let them enjoy the class. Yeah, and like, do you expect your kid to be a professional what they're baseball player if you let them play baseball in school? What they're expecting is the sort of dedication that and the hyper focus that most young children just don't have. Mm -hmm. be because That's they think shame. that if their kid loves it, they'll have that ability. But you can love, I'm speaking from ADHD experience, you can love, love something and not always have the ability to put the focus on that thing that you love, too. So... Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. When I was teaching in my studio downtown, I would have, I would have kind of the serious track, which would be like, you take drawing classes for a year or two, then you take watercolor. And um, then by then you'd often, just because I was teaching children, they'd be off to high school and have more comp more commitments and other things that they would go into. But then for kids that uh, they didn't really want to go through that they mm -hmm. just want to have fun and make art I had a mixed media class and we just did a different mm -hmm. project every week and versus the drawing class which we would build and we might have some projects took over a couple of weeks and that felt great and the parents were very the parents were very um uh, appreciative of that and they were totally fine with that and and the the ironic thing was that these were all classes that you had yeah. to attend and I ran into something with the library I I feel we've been talking for so long I hope I haven't said this story already but um but the, at the library, I used to do a class where um, it was just drop in once uh, every once a once a week, and sometimes nobody mm -hmm. would show up. Sometimes I'd have two people, and it was free, and I'd have a project planned, and people just didn't yeah. value it. And so I'm like, yeah, I guess this the need isn't here anymore. I'll do something else with my time. And then as soon as the we had got a new library, and and she's like, I'm charging for this class. I'm charging five dollars. Yeah, yeah, Packed yeah, every single time waiting list packed because people valued it because it cost money even though it was just just five dollars see people valued it because it cost money what are the the classes that i'm doing right now with the library those are free to the students and i'm good i'm good with that and we have a core group which i love these kids um but it's because they're all they've all become friends with each other so part of the incentive of coming is like they get to draw but they also get to hang out with their friends and go to other schools um but <laughs> Like, I would like to also go back into private teaching and not like charge an exorbitant amount, but like you are, you are correct. If people don't pay for it, they don't value it in general and they're not going to prioritize it. They're not going to make the time for it. They're just going to not show up. I noticed a, su a similar thing on YouTube and generally 99.5% of my viewers are wonderful, delightful people, very respectful and just, just happy to be here. Happy to, you know, listen to what I'm saying, paint along, do all that. But then, you know, you get those, you know, those rude, nasty commenters and I'm like, what do you want? It's free. You know, in my paid classes, I never get nasty comments. You know, when people pay to take a class, online teachable, or uh, they're doing my critique club, never nasty comments. If there was a problem, they email yeah. me privately, and it's never like a, you suck, you know, not like on YouTube. It's like, well, why did you do this? That's awful. You don't know what you're doing, you know? And it's like, it's it's a free tutorial. Like, if you don't like it, go find another yeah, one. You yeah, know? The, and, and honestly, the internet is full of free tutorials, and there's going to be somebody else doing it a mm -hmm. different way. Goodbye. Enjoy that. The, I, the, the beautiful thing about the internet. Yeah, it's like, why? Yeah, it's like, why, why leave a comment to complain when that's taking more time out of your life? You can go find something else that's going to fulfill your needs. I just don't, I don't, I don't get it. But definitely people seem to value things they pay for more than stuff that's just 
just free out there, which is kind of crazy, you know, especially with people so, so, uh, um, you know, so broke these days where like every penny counts, you think they would seek out those valuable resources online when they could. Yeah. And, yeah um, I mean, that's what got me into doing online yeah. to like, uh, teaching online tutorials on Tumblr and on my blog and stuff was like, a lot of my early education was through the internet because my parents could not afford to send me to art classes. And this was a resource that I, and my library didn't have like an art book section at the time. So this was a resource that I could access for free. Yeah, absolutely. And if you live in a rural area, you might not have the ability to find an artist that's willing to teach or a class that's, you know, mm -hmm. available to children, especially. So, yeah. Well, oh my goodness, we've been talking <laughs> for two and a half hours. Is there anything else you want to add before, uh, um, before I let you go? Uh Ostent ostensibly this was supposed to be about NAMT. I'm not blaming you. Um, I think we did have, I think we did talk about some interesting things though. And, um, it's always a joy to get to talk to another artist. Um, so I will say this to kind of circle it back to NAMTA. If you are hyper-focused on art supplies and you like to review art supplies, NAMTA might be a good choice for you. But if you are a general artist and they're still doing these events, I don't know if they are. Events like Art of the Carolinas, Hands-On Creativity, where these companies are coming out and this is intended for artists, it's artists facing, is going to be a better fit for you. I noticed I had a different experience than some of the other people who talked about NAMTA on YouTube. Um, I didn't make it to the Mardi Gras social. They might have been giving out all the samples in the world at that. I, I just didn't do to a registration snafu. There really weren't like that many samples. It wasn't like... Uh, Stonehenge had paper packs out for everybody. It's not like Canton had paper packs out. So if you're an artist and you're looking for art supplies to try to see if like this is a good fit for you, hands-on creativity, art of the Carolinas, artists facing events like this are going to be much more valuable than a NAMTA membership. Like this is a really specialized thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was uh, I was wondering if you would consider it worth it to the average the average uh, artist I don't to know attend. That the average artist would be eligible for a membership anyway. And I'm not being ugly. Like I didn't think I thought there was a good chance they were going to shoot me down because my numbers are not like super exciting. Um, so I was kind of impressed when they approved my membership. Um, for your average artist, you're not going to get to take home a lot of samples. Now, okay, I'll, I'll caveat. This was an opportunity for me to talk to different brands about the possibility of working with their product, like creating product art for them, creating product tutorials, product demos for them. So if you are an artist and you really want to work with a company, this could be a good chance to do that. But so could going to hands-on creativity and bringing your portfolio and making friends with them there. Also, a lot of companies yeah, kind of hire wonder... product reps who are, they can tell you about the products, but they're not artists. They don't know about the products and they're not in a position to decide whether or not they want to hire artists or not to. Yeah, I wonder if you might get more traction as an artist and wants to work with a company if you use their products in artwork and tag that them on social media or reach out to them I that way. I used to be really, never, really yeah. like adamant about doing that um, and it never never panned off out. Now I just tag them. So other people, like if I like the product, so other people know what I was using. Yeah. I tag whenever I can. I don't, um, I'm not looking to work with any of those, any of the brands, but, um, I just figured, Hey, why might as well yeah, just tag, maybe the they'll share it for. basically. I'm hoping they'll share it on their, on their social media. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know where, where you've got, where they've got so many distractions. I wonder if an artist would leave an impression in their mind in the show when there's so well, many people. there weren't and it, or, uh, the people there, there weren't that many people at the show so that was kind of it was kind of yeah. quiet and a lot of people were surprised at how many local brick and mortars were no longer coming and buying from them so that kind of i i hate saying this like that because it's it's awful but like in that way it worked in my favor because a lot of them were bored and willing to let me interview them and willing to let me talk to them for my little youtube channel that and if they had been busy, that yeah, wouldn't that's have a lot happened. of money. Right. I wonder if um because like I always wondered this with like the the creative the CHA with like the scrapbooking companies back when there were a lot more scrapbook stores. If having all of the um I I don't know if you 
fo- ever followed it, but there was a company or a, uh, sh- it was a podcaster. The podcast was called Paper Clipping Roundtable. And um, the woman that hosted it would do the most um, thorough coverage of the CHA. And she would go early and get like prearranged interviews with the different, like with Ranger and all these different companies and get to like the overview before the show floor opened. And um, I kind of wondered if, and there were a lot of other people back in the day that were doing that craft test, craft test. Yes, Dummies would I used, do it. I Melody Lank, Lane would CJ do it. Coverage. Yeah, they had great coverage. And so I kind of wondered if uh, a lot of stores might just hold back and wait for the videos to come out to decide what they wanted to buy. Because at that point, they could see what is what is trending. Because if you're kind of like flying the wall, you're saying, oh, this product is getting all of these questions people are excited about this uh, that's something i should i should carry versus just being sold to by the uh the brand reps so that's why i'm not that's why i'm surprised that more um companies wouldn't want people filming in their booth because just to get that little free word of mouth uh publicity on the internet just for store owners that don't want to pay the money to go out there or I don't know. have the time to my leave their store did go because it was in new Orleans. So it was convenient for them, but they also asked me what I saw <laughs> that I wanted them to order. So they kind of took advantage of both. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah. They I know. Well, right. They might as well. You want to get all the feedback, especially with a, especially with a small store, you've got limited space An online store. You can add as many products as you want. You don't have limited shelf space, but in an, in an actual store, you've got to be careful because you don't want to sit on something for you know three years yeah. and have it go bad before you can sell it. So I totally, I totally get that. Um, well, this has been wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for oh, indulging no. me in a long you, geeky you, chat. No, this was an indulgence to me because I wanted to talk to you about uh, Namta and Creativation. Um, I am legit surprised that there weren't more art YouTubers there. Like I just. I was surprised by that. Um, And while there were social events and they weren't such a great fit for me, so I didn't go, but like I would have liked more low key social events for the artists and the art supply press to like talk to each other and kind of meet each other. And there wasn't really, I'm not talking bad about NAMTA and New Orleans is a hard city to work with. Like the downtown is expensive and kind of a pain in the but to navigate. So like, I'm not really bad talking NAMTA, but there just wasn't like good, like hangout spaces. There was a, um, a creatives lounge. And like, when we went up there, there were just like these overstuffed leather sofas and like nothing going on in there. So I think more, I wonder if they, Oh, I was just going to say, I wonder if they chose a city like New Orleans, because they would also do like Anaheim and Phoenix, if they choose, and they're doing Seattle next year. I wonder if they chose the city because they knew that would be enough of a tourist attraction to bring people. They just wanted to see the city. So if they if they going to the trade show wasn't quite enough of a pull to get you there, then being in New Orleans would be enough pull. Like my parents have a lumber yard and they always do their trade show. Their trade shows they go to are in mm-hmm. uh, Orlando. So you've got, they, they pull them down there because they know they can get people to go to Orlando. There's all the theme parks. There's um, lots going on. People will bring their families and, you know, they just got to, they got to go to the trade show. And then I think so, their room so is calm the or something thing. like that. I thought so. the same thing. And Louisiana and New Orleans do have things to offer. Downtown is kind of a weird situation, but there's there's reasons to come to Louisiana and it's not just Bourbon Street. So I would try to make conversation with a lot of these people. And a lot of them were like not interested in leaving the hotel, really. They weren't interested in going to find tasty things to eat. And this is an area to eat. They weren't really, they were interested in New Orleans like a costume. They weren't really interested in New Orleans at all. So it was hard to connect because like I'm from here and I even got a couple of comments of like, oh, I didn't realize New Orleans had like illustrator artists. And I'm like, what? Like they thought we were all jazz musicians. What do they think? Like, okay. I don't even like jazz. You're either a jazz musician or you're building right, a float. Well, <laughs> well, some people didn't even know that those floats are built by individual companies. Like C to the line works on floats. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. An education. That's, that's a, yeah, for sure. But it looked like the people that went had a, had a good time did, nonetheless yeah. anyway from the videos they that I saw. They got with alcohol and ice yeah. cream and beignets. So I hope they had a good time. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it looked like a good party. So I'm glad you had a chance to go and 
you took us along for the ride and I'm looking forward to all of the interviews they're going to be releasing over the next few weeks. Um, I will have links to all of Becca's social media channels, especially YouTube, where you're going to be able to find her stuff. Um, she posted a three hour long vlog where she basically took you to the show floor, then took you back to her yep. house and talked about the stuff, uh, flipped through catalogs, which, oh my gosh, I love looking through those catalogs. I can never tell if them. people are interested and in just that kind of or not. About the... Like, I like that kind of stuff. Oh, I... I thought it was cool. Actually, it was really funny because um, not not that video in particular, but you had reviewed a um, some art books from other YouTubers and you had done one by here at yes. Landgraf and you were flipping through the book and I'm like, that's a gorgeous book. I would have it on my coffee table just to flip through and look it at the pretty a, colors because it was just such a pretty book. It is a, a really pretty book. Really yeah, and just seeing like the yeah. big swatches of color, it's like, oh, if I was, that would be useful if I was thinking about, I wanted to add a special effect watercolor to my palette, the way she had those really wide stripes of of paint in that. And I mean, I'm sure when you're putting that much photography in a book, you probably have to go a little bit lighter on the education, but just as far as a, a pretty book, yeah. it was pretty to look at. And I know like I have a hard time focusing down, I prefer to learn art by, um, a lot of times I'll just be listening to somebody talk about it, like, and I'll be creating, but like flipping through uh, a book or a magazine article about um, an art technique or whatnot, I, I don't know, I have a hard time focusing, but to like to hear somebody talk about it, that's probably why I love podcasting so much, to hear somebody talk about it while I'm exploring and just kind of jumping in, it's like I don't read the brochure, I jump right in, you know, to see what I could do with it so a book like that would actually would keep my attention because i'd just be looking at the interesting colors and be like oh i wonder how they you, did that maybe i'll go try what i have and see if i can do that too you, you know would what probably I mean? really like japanese art books where they're just collections of high-res scans of beautiful traditional media illustrations i, I have a bunch i've never seen any um, so that's I cool I a few of them on the channel before like a while back and i keep meaning to like go through my collection and do like another flip through because often when i'm reviewing western artist books i am comparing them against japanese and chinese books which are really good <laughs> they're really good like it's a high mm -hmm. standard to me um and it might be a little unfair because they're yeah. really they've been doing they have an industry that sustains this they have a huge demand for it they have a really robust used book industry for these kind of books as well like there's a good end of life for japanese and chinese art books that we just don't have over here oh no i feel like it's definitely another fast fashion situation kind of like i uh, I think so much in the craft industry is kind of like a fast fashion, churn it out as fast as you can, sell as much as you can, and then get onto the next thing. You don't keep it. You don't support it after that's, it's, you know, had its launch. That's what worries me about. I, I think a lot of books are like that, That's what worries too. me about white labeled art supplies is it feels kind yeah. of like it's hitting those notes. Not all white yeah. labeled, but yeah, like sure. and the then prevalence you... of it. Mm -hmm. And then you can end up with so much stuff and so much identical stuff. And then you're just overwhelmed and you could have bought something really nice from um, Da Vinci, Daniel Smith, Faber-Castell, but instead you bought all these kind of lesser versions of the product, but then you also feel like, well, I got to use it up before I buy something yeah. good. And meanwhile, the the companies that are providing, that are doing the research and providing the really high quality materials can't keep the yep. doors open yep. because they're not, they're the market has been so diluted. It's kind of like when a Walmart moves into town and then people go and yeah. shop at Walmart instead of their local grocer and their local, um, well, whatever store, like other stores you go to in your, your local the, bookstore and your the local potting shed. Yeah. 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 And then they all close and then people are upset that they don't have the variety of those high quality items. Yeah. You know, but they, you know, obviously you want to save money where you can. So you'd go to the bigger thing. There's a store, there's a, and oh my God, it's almost three hours here. Um, but the, just one more thing. There is this, um, there's this town that I absolutely love visiting. It's pretty close to, to here. It's it's about probably half an hour away called Belfast. Okay, yeah. It's on the coast and it's such a be beautiful community. It's, um, there's wonderful places to eat that aren't crazy expensive. There's all, there's so many little, there's like three bookstores. There's an art supply store. There's a puzzle store. There's a, a green store, which is all like, it's called the green store. And it's all eco-friendly stuff. Um, and there's a little movie theater. There's all these little, these little shops. They, this town fought to keep Walmart out. And I think if Walmart had gotten a foothold in there, it would have just taken enough away 
from all these little shops and what they sell that they wouldn't be able to they wouldn't be able to make it but since walmart was never allowed to set up shop these little shops could stay open because like this the the art supply fabric store it's not the biggest place it doesn't have the hugest variety but it's really sweet and it has yeah. good things and the prices are right but i think the walmart's fabric section and the walmart's little art supply aisle would have done enough damage that they wouldn't have been able to stay open and so on and so forth to all those little downtown but you but I, we went down there sunday and there were so many families playing on the beach i actually took some photos like so I stealthily just took some pictures from behind so i could sketch them later and there were people that were renting kayaks and you know just everyone is just wandering around the the coast area enjoying it you didn't have to spend money if you just wanted to go spend the day you could go spend the time in any of the parks or on the beach so you say you know, this, and, it, and you could do it this for free, is what i but, want for louisiana yeah because oh, we yeah. have stuff yeah, like weather this all year round and people don't know yeah wow go find me down visit. there you're gonna have yeah, to tell me where to go i'd be happy to <laughs> That'd be fun. We, That'd be fun in the winter, especially. Well, I am a big proponent of Louisiana in early spring, like late mid-March. It starts yeah. getting warm. And then the Louisiana yeah. irises are blooming in the swamp. Like it's my favorite time of year. Yeah. Oh, it's nice. really gorgeous. Oh, so, it sounds beautiful. I can't sell Louisiana. Well, thank you very much for... So oh, thank you very much for joining me on this podcast today. It was a lot of fun. And um, hopefully people took a chance to listen to the entire conversation <laughs> because even though we didn't stick to topic as well as we should have, I think there was a lot of interesting little detours along the way. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, in some of my favorite art um, books, they will take those detours and it's interesting to see where their mind goes and then how they connect it back. I, I love those kind of myriad of connections that circle back. Yeah, well, I think that's where creativity lies, finding those connections between disparate objects and seeing how they relate to each other. And then having people think of different things in new ways and maybe think of things in a different light that they yeah. hadn't thought of. And we've covered a lot of topics today, so so hopefully. Uh, well, I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much for being here today. I want to thank everybody that listened or watched. If you're listening in your podcast player and uh, you want to see our smiling faces, you can check it out on YouTube. Um, and you can find all of Becca's information in the show notes and in the video description. Thank you so much for watching and listening. And until next time, as always, happy crafting.